Chapter 106 Through the ancient, forgotten pathways of Oakwald, through the Peranth Mountains, the Lord of the North and Little Folk had led them. Swift and unfaltering, racing against doom, they had made their last push northward. They had barely stopped to rest. Had left any unnecessary supplies behind. The Rook Scouts had not dared to fly ahead for fear of being discovered by Morath. For fear of ruining the advantage in surprise. Six days of marching, that great army hurrying behind her. Inhospitable terrain smoothed out. Little rivers froze over for their passing. The trees blocked out the falling snow. They had traveled through the night yesterday. And when dawn had broken, the Lord of the North had knelt beside Elin and offered himself as her mount. There was no saddle for him, none would ever be permitted or needed. Any rider he allowed on his back, Elin knew, would never fall. Some had knelt when she rode by. Even Dorian and Kaol had inclined their heads. Rowan, atop a fierce-eyed Dargan horse, had only nodded. As if he had always expected her to wind up here, at the head of the army that galloped the final hours to the edge of Arinth. She had fitted her battle crown to her head, along with the armor she'd gathered in Aniel, and outfitted herself with whatever spare weapons Fenris and Lorcan handed to her. Yurin, Elide, and the healers would remain in the rear until Rux could carry them into Arinth. Dorian and Kaol would lead the wild men of the Fangs on the right flank, the Kaganet royals on the left, Sartake and Nesrin in the skies with the Rux. And Elin and Rowan, with Fenris, Lorcan, and Gavriel, would take the center. The army had spread out as they neared the foothills beyond Arinth, the hills that would take them to the edge of Theralis's plain, and offer their first view of the city beyond it. Heart hammering, the Lord of the North unfaltering, Elin had ascended the last of those hills, the highest and steepest of them, and looked upon Arinth for the first time in ten years. A terrible, pulsing silence went through her. Where a lovely white city had once glittered between river and plain and mountain. Smoke and chaos and terror reigned. The turquoise florine flowed black. The sheer size, the booming of the massive army that thundered against its walls, in the skies above it. She hadn't realized how large Morith's army would be. How small and precious Arinth seemed before it. They're almost through the western gate, Fenris murmured, his face sight gobbling down details. The Kagan's army fanned out around them, across the hill. The crest of a wave soon to break. Yet even the Dargan soldiers hesitated, horses shifting, at the army between them and the city. Rowan's face was grave grave, yet undaunted, as he took in the enemy. So many. So many soldiers. And the Iron Teeth Legion above them. The Krokhans fight at the city walls, Gavriel observed. Indeed, she could barely make out the red cloaks. Man and Black Beak had not broken her vow. And neither would she. Elin glanced at her hand, hidden beneath the gauntlet. To where a scar should have been. I promise you that no matter how far I go, no matter the cost, when you call for my aid, I will come. There would be no time for speeches. No time to rally the soldiers behind her. They were ready. And so was she. Sound the call, Elin ordered Lorcan, who lifted a horn to his lips and blew. Down the line, heralds from the Kaganet sent up their own horns in answer. Until they were all one great, bellowing note, racing toward Arinth. They blew the horns again. Elin drew Goldrin from its sheath across her back and heft her shield as she lifted the sword to the sky. As a thread of her magic pierced the ruby in the pommel and set it glowing. The Dargan soldiers pointed their saldies forward, wood creaking, horse hair whipping in the wind. Down the line, Princess Hassar and Prince Kashin trained their own spears at the enemy army. Dorian and Kaol drew their blades and aimed them ahead. Rowan unsheathed his sword, a hatchet in his other hand, his face like stone. Unbreakable. The horns blew a third and final time, the rallying cry singing out across the bloody plain. The Lord of the North reared up, jutting Goldrin higher into the sky, 
and Elin unleashed a flash of fire through the ruby the signal the army behind her had awaited. For Turason. All of it, for Turason. The Lord of the North landed, the immortal flame within his antlers shining bright as he began the charge. The army around and behind her flowed down the hillside, gaining with each step, barreling toward Morath's back ranks. Barreling toward Arenth. Toward home. Onward into battle they charged, undaunted and raging. The queen atop the white stag did not balk with each gained foot toward the awaiting legions. She only flipped her sword in her hand once, twice, shield arm tucking in tight. The immortal warriors at her side did not hesitate, either, their eyes fixed upon the enemy ahead. Faster and faster, the Kaganid's cavalry galloping beside her, the front line forming, holding, as they neared the first of Morath's back lines. The enemy turned toward them now. Pointed spears, archers racing into position. The first impact would hurt. Many would go down before they even reached it. But the front line had to make it. They could not break. From the enemy lines, an order arose. Archers. Bowstrings groaned, targets were fixed. Volley. Great iron arrows blotted out the sun, aiming for the racing cavalry. But rocks, golden and brown and black as night, dove, dove, dove from the skies, flying wing to wing. And as those arrows arced toward the earth, the rocks intercepted them, taking the brunt as they shielded the charging army beneath them. Rocks went down. And even the queen leading the charge wept in rage and grief as the birds and their riders crashed to the earth. Above her, taking arrow after arrow, shield raised to the skies, a young rider roared her battle cry. The front lines could not break. Iron teeth witches on wyvern's bank toward them, toward the rucks soaring for their exposed back. In the city, along Arintha's walls, a white-haired queen bellowed, push. 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 Exhausted witches took to the skies, on broom and beast, swords lifting. Racing for the front of the aerial legion turning to the rucks. To crush the iron teeth legion between them. On the bloody ground, Morath aimed spears, pikes, swords, anything they bore at the thundering cavalry. It was not enough to stop them. Not when shields of wind and flame and blackest death locked into place and sliced into the front lines of Morath. Felling the soldiers braced for battle. Exposing those behind still waiting to raise weapons. Leaving Morath wide open for the golden army as it slammed into them with the force of a tidal wave. Chapter 107 Rowan's breath was a steady rasp in his throat as he charged through the lines of Valg soldiers, screaming ringing out around him. Nearby, cutting a swath through Morath's masses, Elin and the Lord of the North fought. Soldiers swarmed, but neither Queen nor Stag balked. Not when Elin's flame, reduced as it was, kept any in her blind spots from landing a blow. The Dargan cavalry shoved Morath back, and above them, rucks and wyverns clashed. Beasts, feathered and scaled, crashed to the earth. Still Bort fought above the queen, guarding her from the iron teeth who spotted that white stag, as good as a banner amid the sea of darkness, and aimed for her. At Bort's side, her betrothed guarded their flank, and Falcon Enner, in rook form, guarded her other. His Dargan horse fearless, Rowan swept out his left arm, hatchet singing. A Valg had tumbled away, but Rowan was already slashing with his sword at his next opponent. The odds were against them, even with the planning they'd done. Yet if they could liberate the city, regroup and restock, before Erewhon and Maeve arrived, they might stand a chance. For Erewhon and Maeve would come. At some point, they would come, and Elin would want to face them. Rowan had no intention of letting her do so alone. Rowan glanced toward Elin. She had plowed farther ahead, the front line spreading out, swarms of Morath soldiers between them. Stay close. He had to stay close. A crooken swept by, shooting past Rowan to rise up, up upright to the unprotected underbelly of an iron teeth which is wyvern. Sword raised, the witch raced along its underside, swift and brutal. 
where she passed, blood and gore reigned. The beast groaned, wings splaying, and Rowan threw out a gust of wind. The wyvern crashed onto Morith's ranks with a boom that sent his own damned horse plowing away. When the shuddering wings had stilled, when Rowan had steadied his horse and felled the soldiers rushing at him, he again searched for Ilan. But his mate was no longer near him. No, charging ahead, a vision of gold and silver, Elin had gotten so far away that she was nearly beyond sight. There was no sign of Gavriel, either. Yet Fenris battled near Rowan's other side, Lorcan on his left a dark, deadly wind lashing out in time with his sword. Once, they had been little more than slaves to a queen who had unleashed them across the world. Together, they had taken on armies and decimated cities. He had not cared then whether he walked off those distant battlefields. Had not cared whether those kingdoms fell or survived. He had been given his orders, and had executed them. But here, today. Elin had given them no order, no command other than the very first they'd sworn to obey, to protect Teresan. So they would. And together, they would do so, Cotter once more. They would fight for this kingdom their new court their new home. He could see it in Fenris's eyes as he cut a soldier in two with a deep slice to the middle. Could see that vision of a future on Lorcan's raging face as the warrior wielded magic and blade to rip through the enemy ranks. Cotter, yet more than that. Brothers the warriors fighting at his side were his brothers. Had stayed with him through all of it. And would continue to do so now. It steeled him as much as the thought of his mate, still fighting ahead. He had to get to her, keep close. They all did. Arenth depended upon it. No longer slaves. No longer raging and broken. A home. This would be their home. Their future. Together. Morith soldiers fell before them. Some outright ran as they beheld who battled closer. Perhaps why Maeve had gathered them in the first place. Yet she had never been able to fully harness it their potential, their true might. Had chosen shackles and pain to control them. Unable to comprehend, to even consider, that glory and riches only went so far. But a true home, and a queen who saw them as males and not weapons. Something worth fighting for. No enemy could withstand it. Lorcan and Fenris battling at his side, Rowan gritted his teeth and urged his horse after Elin, into the chaos and death that raged and raged and did not stop. Elin had come. Had escaped Maeve, and had come. Edian couldn't believe it. Even as he saw the army that fought with her. Even as he saw Kaol and Dorian leading the right flank, charging with the front lines and wild men of the fangs, the king's magic blasting in plumes of ice into the enemy. Kaol Westfall had not failed them. And had somehow convinced the Kagan to send what appeared to be the majority of his armies. But that army was inching toward Arinth, still far across the Alice. Morith did not halt its assault on Arinth's two gates. The southern held strong. But the western gate it was beginning to buckle. Lysandra had shifted into a wyvern and soared with the desperate, final push of Man and Blackbeak and the Crockhans toward the Iron Teeth Legion, hoping to crush it between them and the Rucks. The shifter now fought there, lost amid the fray. So Edian charged down to the western gate, a battle cry on his lips as his men led him right up to the iron doors and the enemy army just visible through the sundering plates. The moment the gate opened, it would be over. Edian's drained legs shook, his arms strained, but he held his ground. For whatever few breaths he had left. Elin had come. It was enough. Dorian's magic snapped out of him, felling the charging soldiers. Side by side with Kaol, the wild men of the fangs around them, they cleared a path through Morith's ranks, their swords plunging and lifting, their breath a burn in their throats. He had never seen battle. Knew he never wished to again. The chaos, the noise, the blood, the horses screaming but he was not afraid. And Kaol, riding near him, breaking soldiers between them, did not hesitate. Only slaughtered onward, teeth gritted. 
for a darlin for what had been done to it and what it might become. The words echoed in his every panting breath. For a darlin. Morath's army stretched ahead, still between them and the battered walls of Arinth. Dorian didn't let himself think of how many remained. He only thought of the sword and shield in his hands, Damaris already bathed in blood, of the magic he wielded to supplement his strikes. He wouldn't shift not yet. Not until his weapons and magic began to fail him. He'd never fought in another form, but he'd try. As a wyvern or a rook, he'd try. Somewhere above him, man and black beak flew. He didn't dare look up long enough to hunt for a gleam of silver-white hair, or for the shimmer of spider-silk grafted wings. He did not see any of the thirteen. Or recognize any of the crockhans as they swept overhead. So Dorian kept fighting, his brother in soul and in arms beside him. He'd only let himself count at the end of the day. If they survived. If they made it to the city walls. Only then would he tally the dead. There was only Elin's besieged city, and the enemy before it, and the ancient sword in her hand. Siege towers neared the walls, three clustering near the southern gate, each teeming with soldiers. Still too far away to reach. And too distant for her magic. Magic that was already draining, swift and fleeting, from her veins. No more endless well of power. She had to conserve it, wield it to her best advantage and use the training that had been instilled in her for the past ten years. She had been an assassin long before she'd mastered her power. It was no hardship to fall back on those skills. To let Goldrin draw blood, to engage multiple soldiers and leave them bleeding out behind her. The Lord of the North was a storm beneath her, his white coat stained crimson and black. That immortal flame between his antlers didn't so much as flutter. Overhead the skies rained blood, witch and wyvern and rook alike dying and fighting. Bort still covered her, engaging any iron teeth who swooped from above. Minutes were hours, or perhaps the opposite was true. The sun peaked and began its descent, shadows lengthening. Rowan and the others had been scattered across the field, but an icy blast of wind every now and then told her that her mate still fought, still killed his way through the ranks still attempted to reach her side once more. Slowly, Arinth began to loom closer. Slowly, the walls went from a distant marker to a towering presence. The siege towers reached the walls, and soldiers poured unchecked over the battlements. Yet the gates still held. Elin lifted her head to give the order to Bort and Urin to bring the siege towers down. Just in time to see the six iron teeth wyverns and riders slam into the rucks. Sending Bort, Falcon, and Urin scattering, Rook and Wyvern screaming as they hit the earth and rolled. Clearing the path overhead for a gargantuan Wyvern to come diving for Ilan. She blasted a wall of flame skyward as the Wyvern stretched out its claws for her, for the Lord of the North. The Wyvern banked, rising, and dove again. The Lord of the North reared, holding his ground as the Wyvern aimed for them. But Ilan leaped from his back, and slapped his flank with the flat of her sword, throat so broken from roaring that she couldn't form the words. Go. The Lord of the North only lowered his head as the wyvern barreled toward them. She did not have enough magic not to turn the thing into ashes. So Elin threw her magic around the stag. And stepped from the orb of flame, shield up and sword angled. She braced herself for the impact, took in every detail on the wyvern's armor, where it was weakest, where she might strike if she could dodge the snapping jaws. The carrion on its breath was a hot blast as its maw opened wide. Its head went tumbling to the ground. Not tumbling so much as smashing. Beneath a spiked, massive tail. Belonging to an attacking wyvern with emerald eyes. Elin crouched as the riderless wyvern whirled on the gaping iron teeth which, still atop her beheaded mount. With one slamming sweep of the tail, the green-eyed wyvern impaled the witch on its spikes and sent her body hurling across the field. Then the flash and shimmer. And a ghost leopard now hurtled toward her, and Elin toward it. She flung her arms around the leopard as it rose up, massive body almost knocking her to the ground. Well met, my friend, 
was all Elin could manage to say as she embraced Lysandra. A horn blared from the city a frantic call for help. Elin and Lysandra whirled toward Arinth. Toward the three siege towers against the walls by the southern gate. Emerald eyes met those of turquoise and gold. Lysandra's tail bobbed. Elin grinned. Shall we? He had to get to her side again. A battlefield separating them, Rowan slaughtered his way toward Elin, Fenris, and Lorcan keeping close. Pain had become a dull roar in his ears. He'd long since lost track of his wounds. He remembered them only because of the iron shard an arrow to his shoulder had left when he wrenched it free. A foolish, hasty mistake. The iron shard was enough to keep him from shifting, from flying to her. He hadn't dared to pause long enough to fish it from him, not with the teeming enemy. So he kept fighting, his cotter with him. Their horses charged bold and dauntless beneath them, gaining ground, but he could not see Elin. Only the Lord of the North, bounding across the battlefield, aiming for Oakwald. As if he had been set free. Fenris, face splattered with black blood, shouted, Where is she? Rowan scanned the field, heart thundering. But the bond in his chest glowed strong, fire bright. Lorcan only pointed ahead. To the city walls by the southern gate. To the ghost leopard tearing through the droves of Morith soldiers, spurts of flame accompanying her as a golden armored warrior raced at her side. To the three siege towers wreaking havoc on the walls. With the tower's open sides, Rowan could see everything as it unfolded. Could see Elin and Lysandra charge up the ramp within, slicing and shredding soldiers between them, level after level after level. Where one missed a soldier, the other felled him. Where one struck, the other guarded. All the way up, to the small catapult near its top. Soldiers screamed, some leaping from the tower as Lysandra shredded into them. While Elin threw herself at the rungs lining the catapult's wheeled base, and began pushing. Turning it. Away from Arinth, from the castle. Precisely as Elin had told him Sam Cortland had done in Skull's Bay, the catapult's mechanisms allowed her to rotate its base. Rowan wondered if the young assassin was smiling now smiling to see her heaving the catapult into position. All the way to the siege tower at its left. On the second tower, a red-haired figure had fought her way onto the upper level. And was turning the catapult toward the third and final tower. Ansel of Briarcliff. A flash of Ansel's sword, and the catapult snapped, hurling the boulder it contained. Just as Elin brought down Goldrin upon the catapult before her. Twin boulders soared. And slammed into the siege towers beside them. Iron groaned, wood shattered. And the two towers began to topple. Where Ansel of Briarcliff had gone to escape the destruction, even Rowan could not follow. Not as Elin remained atop the first siege tower, and leaped upon the now outstretched arm of the catapult, jutting over the battlefield below. Not as she shouted to Lysandra, who shifted again, a wyvern rising up from a ghost leopard's leap. Grabbing the catapult's outstretched arm in one to lone foot while plucking up Elin in another. With a mighty flap, Lysandra ripped the catapult from its bolts atop the tower. And twisting, she swung it into the final siege tower. Sending it crashing to the ground. Right onto a horde of Morith soldiers trying to batter their way through the southern gate. Wide-eyed, the three fey warriors blinked. That's where Ilan is, was all Fenris said. Saki remained airborne. So did Sartake, Katara with him. That was all Nesrin knew, all she cared about, as they took on wyvern after wyvern after wyvern. They were so much worse in battle than she'd anticipated. As swift and fearless as the rucks might be, the wyverns had the bulk. The poisoned barbs in their tails. And soulless riders who weren't afraid to destroy their mounts if it meant bringing down a rook with them. Close now. The Kaganet's army had pushed closer and closer to besiege the Rinth, flaming and shattered. If they could continue to hold their advantage, they might very well break them against the walls, as they had destroyed Morith's legion in Aniel. They had to act swiftly, though. 
the enemy swarmed both city gates, determined to break in. The southern gate held, the siege towers that had been attacking it moments ago now in ruins. But the western gate it would not remain sealed for long. Saki rising up from the melee to catch his breath, Nesrin dared to gauge how many Rukin still flew. Despite the Krokhans and rebel iron teeth, they were outnumbered, but the Rukin were fresh. Ready and eager for battle. It was not the number of remaining Rukin that snatched the breath from her chest. But what came up behind them? Nesrin Dove. Dove for Sartake, Katara ripping the throat from a wyvern mid-flight. The prince was panting, splattered with blue and black blood, as Nesrin fell into flight beside him. Put out the call, she shouted over the din, the roar of the wind. Get to the city walls. To the southern gate. Sartake's eyes narrowed beneath his helmet, and Nesrin pointed behind them. To the secondary dark host creeping at their backs. Right from Peranth, where they had no doubt been hidden. The rest of Morat's host. Iron teeth witches and wyverns with them. This battle had been a trap. To lure them here, to expend their forces defeating this army. While the rest snuck behind and trapped them against Arintha's walls. The western gate sundered at last. Edian was ready when it did. When the battering ram knocked through, iron screaming as it yielded. Then there were Morath soldiers everywhere. Shield to shield, Edian had arranged his men into a phalanx to greet them. It was still not enough. The Bane could do nothing to stop the tide that poured from the battlefield, pushing them back, back, back up the passageway. And even Ren, leading the men atop the walls, could not halt the flow that surged over them. They had to shut the gate again. Had to find a way to get it shut. Edian could barely draw breath could barely keep his legs under him. A warning horn rang out. Morath had sent a second army. Darkness shrouded the full extent of their ranks. Valg princes lots of them. Morath had been waiting. Ren shouted down to him over the fray, they cleared the southern gate. They're getting as many of our forces as they can behind the walls. To regroup and rally before meeting the second army. But with the western gate still open, Morath teeming through, they'd never stand a chance. He had to get the gate shut. Edian and the Bane stabbed and slashed, a wall for Morath to break against. But it would not be enough. A wyvern came crashing toward the gate, flipping across the ground as it rolled toward them. Edian braced for the impact, for that huge body to shatter through the last of the gate. Yet the felled beast halted, squashing soldiers beneath its bulk, right at the archway. Blocking the way. A barricade before the western gate. Intentionally so, Edian realized as a golden-haired warrior leaped from the wyvern saddle, the dead iron teeth which still dangling there, throat gushing blue blood down the leathery sides. The warrior ran toward them, a sword in one hand, the other drawing a dagger. Ran toward Edian, his tawny eyes scanning him from head to toe. His father, Chapter 108 Morath's soldiers clawed and crawled over the fallen wyvern blocking their path. They filled the archway, the passage. A golden shield held them at bay. But not for long. Yet the reprieve Gavriel bought them allowed the bane to drain the last dregs of their water skins, to pluck up fallen weapons. Edian panted, an arm braced against the gate passageway. Behind Gavriel's shield, the enemy teamed and raged. Are you hurt? His father asked. His first words to him. Edian managed to lift his head. You found Elin, was all he said. Gavriel's face softened. Yes. And she sealed the word gate. Edian closed his eyes. At least there was that. Erewhon. No. He didn't need the specifics on why the bastard wasn't dead. What had gone wrong? Edian pushed off the wall, swaying. His father steadied him with a hand to the elbow. You need rest. Edian yanked his arm out of Gavriel's grip. Tell that to the soldiers who have already fallen. You will fall, too, his father said, sharper than he'd ever heard, 
if you don't sit down for a minute. Edian stared the male down. Gavriel stared right back. No bullshit, no room for argument. The face of the lion. Edian just shook his head. Gavriel's golden shield buckled under the onslaught of the Valg still teeming beyond it. We have to get the gate shut again, Edian said, pointing to the two cleaved but intact doors pushed against the walls. Access to them blocked by the Morith grunts still trying to break past Gavriel's shield. Or they'll overrun the city before our forces can regroup. Getting behind the walls would make no difference if the western gate was wide open. His father followed his line of sight. Looked upon the soldiers trying to get past his defenses, their flow forced to a trickle by the wyvern he'd so carefully downed before them. Then we shall shut them, Gavriel said, and smiled grimly. Together. The word was more of a question, subtle and sorrowful. Together. As father and son. As the two warriors they were. Gavriel his father. He had come. And looking at those tawny eyes, Edian knew it was not for Ilan, or for Turason, that his father had done it. Together, Edian rasped. Not just this obstacle. Not just this battle. But whatever would come afterward, should they survive. Together. Edian could have sworn something like joy and pride filled Gavriel's eyes. Joy and pride and sorrow, heavy and old. Edian strode back to the line of the bane, motioning the soldier beside him to make room for Gavriel to join their formation. One great push now, and they'd secure the gate. Their army would enter through the southern one, and they'd find some way to rally before the new army reached the city. But the western one, they'd clear it and seal it. Permanently. Father and son, they would do this. Defeat this. But when his father did not join his side, Edian turned. Gavriel had gone directly to the gate. To the golden line of his shield, now pushing back, back, back. Shoving that wall of enemy soldiers with it, buckling with every heartbeat. Down the passage. Through the archway. No. Gavriel smiled at him. Close the gate, Edian, was all his father said. And then Gavriel stepped beyond the gates. That golden shield spreading thin. No. The word built, a rising scream in Edian's throat. But Bane soldiers were rushing to the gate doors. Heaving them closed. Edian opened his mouth to roar at them to stop. To stop, stop, stop. Gavriel lifted his sword and dagger, glowing golden in the dying light of the day. The gate shut behind him. Sealing him out. Edian couldn't move. He had never halted, never ceased moving. Yet he could not bring himself to help with the soldiers now piling wood and chains and metal against the western gate. Gavriel could have stayed. Could have stayed and pushed his shield back long enough for them to shut the gates. He could have remained here Edian ran then. Too slow. His steps were too slow, his body too big and heavy, as he shoved through his men. As he aimed for the stairs up to the walls. Golden light flashed on the battlefield. Then went dark. Edian ran faster, a sob burning his throat, leaping and scrambling over fallen soldiers, both mortal and Valg. Then he was atop the walls. Running for their edge. No. The word was a beat alongside his heart. Edian slaughtered the Valg in his way, slaughtered any who came over the siege ladder. The ladder. He could fight his way down it, get to the battlefield, to his father Edian swung his sword so hard at the Valg soldier before him that the man's head bounced off his shoulders. And then he was at the wall. Peering toward that space by the gate. The battering ram was in splinters. Valg lay piled several deep around it. Before the gate. Around the wyvern. So many that access to the western gate was cut off. So many that the gate was secure, a gaping wound now staunched. How long had he stood there, unable to move? Stood there, unable to do anything while his father did this? It was the golden hair he spotted first. Before the mound of Valg he'd piled high. The gate he'd shut for them. 
the city he'd secured. A terrible, rushing sort of stillness took over Edian's body. He stopped hearing the battle. Stopped seeing the fighting around him, above him. Stopped seeing everything but the fallen warrior, who gazed toward the darkening sky with sightless eyes. His tattooed throat ripped out. His sword still gripped in his hand. Gavriel. His father. Morath's army pulled back from the secured western gate. Pulled back and retreated to the arms of the advancing army. To the rest of Morath's host. Limping from a deep gash in his leg, his shoulder numb from the arrow tip that remained lodged in it, Rowan drove his blade through the face of a fleeing soldier. Black blood sprayed, but Rowan was already moving, aiming for the western gate. Where things had gone so, so still. He'd only aimed for it when he'd spied Elan battling her way toward the distant southern gate, Ansel with her, after they'd brought the siege towers down around it. It was through the secured gate that the bulk of their army now hurried, the Kagan's forces racing to get behind the city walls before they were sealed. They had an hour at most before Morath was again upon them before they were forced to shut the southern gate as well, locking out any left behind to be driven right against the walls. The western gate would remain sealed. The downed wyvern and heaps of bodies around it would ensure that, along with any inner defenses. Rowan had seen the golden light flaring minutes ago. Had battled his way here, cursing the iron shard in his arm that kept him from shifting. Fenris and Lorcan had peeled away to pick off any Morath grunts trying to attack those fleeing for the southern gate, and overhead, Rux bearing the healers, Elide, and Yurin with them, soared into the panicking city. He had to find Elin. Get their plans in motion before it was too late. He knew who likely marched with that advancing host. He had no intention of letting her face it alone. But this task he knew what lay ahead. Knew, and still went. Rowan found Gavriel before the western gate, dozens of the dead piled high around him. A veritable wall between the gate and looming enemy host. The light faded with each minute. Lingering Morath soldiers and iron teeth fled toward their oncoming reinforcements. The Kagan's army tried to kill as many as they could as they hurtled for the southern gate. They had to get inside the city. By any means possible. Hoisting up siege ladders that had been knocked to the earth only minutes or hours earlier, the Kagan's army climbed the walls, some bearing the injured on their backs. His magic little more than a breeze, Rowan gritted his teeth against his throbbing leg and shoulder and hauled away the Morath grunt half sprawled over Gavriel. Centuries of existence, years spent waging war and journeying through the world gone. Rendered into nothing but this still body, this discarded shell. Rowan's knees threatened to buckle. More and more of their forces scaled the city walls, an orderly but swift flight into a temporary haven. Keep going. They had to keep going. Gavriel would wish him to. Had given his life for it. Yet Rowan lowered his head. I hope you found peace, my brother. And in the afterworld, I hope you find her again. Rowan stooped, grunting at the pain in his thigh, and hauled Gavriel over his good shoulder. And then he climbed. Up the siege ladder still anchored beside the western gate. Onto the walls. Each step heavier than the last. Each step a memory of his friend, an image of the kingdoms they had seen, the enemies they had fought, the quiet moments that no song would ever mention. Yet the songs would mention this that the lion fell before the western gate of Arinth, defending the city and his son. If they survived today, if they somehow lived, the bards would sing of it. Even with the chaos of the Kaganet soldiers and Dargan cavalry streaming for the city, silence fell where Rowan strode down the battlement stairs, bearing Gavriel. He barely managed a grateful, relieved nod to a battered and bloody Enda and Selene, catching their breath with a cluster of their cousins by the remnants of their catapults. His blood and kin, yet the warrior over his shoulder Gavriel had also been family. Even when he had not realized it. The impossible, hideous weight at his shoulder grew worse with every step to where Edian stood at the foot of the stairs, the sword of Arinth dangling from his hand. He could have stayed, was all Edian said as Rowan gently set Gavriel down on the first of the steps. 
he could have stayed. Rowan looked at his fallen friend. His closest friend. Who had gone with him into so many wars and dangers. Who had deserved this new home as much as any of them. Rowan closed Gavriel's unseeing eyes. I will see you in the afterworld. Edian's golden hair hung limp with blood and sweat, the ancient sword in his hands caked with black blood. Soldiers streamed past him, down the battlement stairs, yet Edian only stared at his father. A bloodied rock in the stream of war. Then Edian walked into the streets. Tears and screaming would come later. Rowan followed him. We need to prepare for the second part of this battle, Edian said hoarsely. Or we won't last the night. Already, Enda and Selene were using their magic to haul fallen blocks of debris against the western gate. The stones wobbled, but moved. It was more power than Rowan could claim. Rowan turned to climb back up the walls, and didn't dare let himself look behind them to where he knew soldiers were moving Gavriel deeper into the city. Somewhere safe. Gone. His friend, his brother was gone. Your Highness. A panting, blood-splattered rook rider stood on the battlement wall. He pointed to the horizon. Darkness veils much of it, but we have an estimate for the oncoming army. Rowan braced himself. Twenty thousand at a minimum. The rider's throat bobbed. Their ranks are filled with Valg and six Karankui. Not Karankui. But the six Valg princesses who had infested them. Rowan willed himself to shift. His body refused. Gritting his teeth, he peeled back the armor on his shoulder and reached for the wound. But it had sealed. Trapping the iron shard within. Keeping him from shifting from flying to Elin. Wherever she was. He had to get to her. Had to find Fenris and Lorcan and find her. Before it was too late. But as the night fell, as he freed a dagger and lifted it to the sealed wound in his shoulder, Rowan knew it might already be. Even though the gods were now gone, Rowan still found himself praying. Through the agony as he ripped open his shoulder, he prayed. That he might reach Elin in time. They had survived this long, against all odds and in defiance of ancient prophecies. Rowan dug his knife in deeper, seeking the iron shard wedged within. Hurry he had to hurry. Chapter 109 Kaol's back strained, pain lashing down his spine. Whether from his wife's healing within the castle walls or from the hours of fighting, he had no idea. Didn't care, as he and Dorian galloped through the southern gate into Arinth, the two of them little more than unmarked riders amid the army racing in. Bracing for the impact of the fresh host marching toward them. Night would soon fall. Morith would not wait until dawn. Not with the darkness that hovered above them like some sort of awful cloud. What flew and scuttled in that darkness, what waited for them? Dorian was nearly slumped in his saddle, shield strapped over his back, Damaris sheathed at his side. You look how I feel, Kaol managed to say. Dorian slid sapphire eyes toward him, a spark of humor lighting the haunted depths. I know a king shouldn't slouch, he said, rubbing at his blood and dirt splattered face. But I can't bring myself to care. Kaol smiled grimly. We have worse to worry about. Much worse. They hurried toward the castle, turning up the hill that would take them to its doors, when a horn cut across the battlefield. A warning. With the view the hill offered, they could clearly see it. What sent the soldiers racing toward them with renewed urgency? Morith was picking up speed. As if realizing that their prey was on its last legs and not wishing to let them recover. Kaol glanced to Dorian, and they reined their horses back toward the city walls. The Kagan soldiers did so as well, running down the hills they'd been scaling. Back toward the battlements. And the hell soon to be unleashed upon it once more. Slumped against a dead wyvern, Elin drained the last of her water skin. Beside her, Ansel of Briarcliff panted through her gritted teeth while Healer's magic pulled the edges of her wound together. A nasty, deep slice to Ansel's arm. Bad enough that Ansel hadn't been able to hold a weapon. So they had halted, 
just as the tide of the battle had shifted, their enemy now fleeing Arintha's walls. Elin's head swam, her magic down to the dregs, her limbs leaden. The roar of battle still buzzed in her ears. Covered in gore and mud, no one recognized either queen where they'd fallen to their knees, so close to the southern gates. Soldiers ran past, trying to get into the city before the army at their backs arrived. Just a minute. She needed to only catch her breath for a minute. Then they'd hurry to the southern gate. Into Arinth. Into her home. Ansel swore, swaying, and the healer shot out a hand to brace her. Not good. Not at all. Elan knew what and who marched toward them. Lysandra had returned to the skies long ago, rejoining the rebel Iron Teeth and Croc Hans. Where Rowan now was, where the Cotter was, she didn't know. Had lost them hours or days or lifetimes ago. Rowan was safe the mating bond told her enough. No mortal wounds. And through the blood oath, she knew Fenris and Lorcan still breathed. Whether she could say that for the rest of her friends, she didn't know. Didn't want to know, not yet. The healer finished Ansel, and when the woman turned, Elin held up a hand. Go help someone who needs it, Elin rasped. The healer didn't hesitate before she hurried off, sprinting toward the sound of screaming. We need to get into the city, Ansel murmured, leaning her head against the ironclad hide behind her. Before they shut the gate. We do, Elin said willing strength to her exhausted legs so she might stand assess how far away that final, crushing host was. A plan. She'd had a plan for this. They all had. But time hadn't been on her side. Perhaps her luck had faded with the gods she'd destroyed. Elin swallowed against the dryness in her mouth and grunted as she got to her feet. The world swayed, but she stayed upright. Managed to grab the reins of a passing Dargan rider and order her to stop. To take the red-haired queen half delirious on the ground. Ansel barely protested when Elin heaved her into the saddle behind the soldier. Elin stood beside the felled wyvern, watching her friend until she'd passed through the southern gate. Into Arinth. Slowly, Elin turned to the rising wave of darkness. She had doomed them. Behind her, the southern gate groaned shut. The boom echoed into her bones. Soldiers left on the field shouted in panic, but orders went out. Form the lines. Ready for battle. She could do this. Adjust the plan. She still scanned the skies for a white-tailed hawk. No sign of him. Good. Good, she told herself. Elin shut her eyes for a heartbeat put a hand on her chest. As if it might steady her, prepare her, for what squatted in the approaching darkness. Soldiers shouted as they rallied, the screams of the injured and dying ringing throughout, wings booming everywhere. Still Elin remained there for a moment longer, just beyond the gates to her city. Her home. Still she pressed her hand to her chest, feeling the heart thundering beneath, feeling the dust of every road she had traveled these ten years to return here. For this moment. For this purpose. So she whispered it to herself, one last time. The story. Her story. Once upon a time, in a land long since burned to ash, there lived a young princess who loved her kingdom. Yurin had halted her healing only for a few minutes. Her power flowed, strong and bright, undimming despite the work she'd been doing for hours. But she'd stopped, needing to see what had happened. Hearing that their soldiers, with victory in hand, had fled back to the city walls, had only sent her running for the castle battlements faster, allied with her. As she had been all day, helping her. Elied winced as they took the stairs up to the battlements, but made no complaint. The lady scanned the crowded space, looking for someone, something. Her gaze settled on an old man, a child with remarkable red-gold hair beside him. Messengers approached him, then darted away. A leader someone in charge, Yurin realized after Elide did, already limping to them. The old man faced them as they approached, and started. At the sight of Elide. 
Yurin stopped caring about the introductions as her gaze landed on the battlefield. On the army another army marching on them, half veiled in darkness. Six Karen Kui at their front lines. The Kagan soldiers had gathered by the walls, both outside and within the city. The southern gate now stood closed. Not enough. Not nearly enough to face what marched, fresh and unwearied. The creatures she could just barely make out teeming within its ranks. Valg princesses there were Valg princesses amongst them. Kaol. Where was Kaol allied and the old man were speaking? We cannot face that number of soldiers and walk away, the lady said, her voice so unlike any tone Yurin had heard from her. Commanding and cold. Elid pointed to the battlefield. The darkness holy gods, the darkness that massed over it. A chill slithered over Yurin's body. Do you know what that is? Elid asked too quietly. Because I do. The old man only swallowed. Yurin knew it then. What was in that darkness? Who was in it? Erewhon. The last of the sun vanished, setting the bloodied snows in hues of blue. A flash of light flared behind them, and the child whirled, a sob breaking from her throat as a stunningly beautiful woman, bloodied and battered, appeared. She wrapped a cloak around her naked body like a gown, not even shivering with the cold. A shapeshifter. She opened her arms to the girl, embracing her. Lysandra, Kaol had called her. A lady in Elan's court. Unknown niece to Falcon Enner. Lysandra turned to the old man. Edian and Rowan sent up the order, Darrow. Any who can are to evacuate immediately. The old man Darrow just stared toward the battlefield. At a loss for words as that army prowled closer and closer and closer. As two figures took form at its head. And walked, unhindered, toward the city walls, darkness swarming around them. Erewhon. The golden-haired young man. She'd know it if she were blind. A dark-haired, pale-skinned woman strode at his side, robes billowing around her on a phantom wind. Maeve, Lysandra breathed. People began screaming then. In terror and despair. Maeve and Erewhon had come. To personally oversee Arintha's fall. They stalked toward the city gates, the darkness behind them gathering, the army at their backs swelling. Pincers clicked within that darkness. Creatures who could devour life, joy. Oh gods. Lord Darrow, Elid cut in, sharp and commanding. Is there a way out of the city? Some sort of back door through the mountains that the children and elderly could take. Darrow dragged his eyes from the approaching Valg king and queen. It was helplessness and despair that filled them. That broke his voice as he said, no route that will allow them to escape in time. Tell me where it is, Lysandra ordered. So they might try, at least. She grabbed for the girl's arm. So Evangeline might try to run. A defeat. What had seemed like a triumphant victory was about to become an absolute defeat. A butchering. Led by Maeve and Erewhon, now a mere hundred yards from the city walls. Only ancient stone and iron stood between them and Arinth. Darrow hesitated. In shock. The old man was in shock. But Evangeline pointed a finger. Out toward the gates, toward Maeve and Erewhon. Look. And there she was. In the deepening blues of descending night, amid the snow beginning to fall, Elan Galathenius had appeared before the sealed southern gate had appeared before Erewhon and Maeve. Her unbound hair billowed in the wind like a golden banner, a last ray of light with the dying of the day. Silence fell. Even the screaming stopped as all turned toward the gate. But Elan did not balk. Did not run from the Valg queen and king who halted as if in delight at the lone figure who dared face them. Lysandra let out a strangled sob. She she has no magic left. The shifter's voice broke. She has nothing left. Still Elan lifted her sword. Flames ran down the blade. One flame against the darkness gathered. One flame to light the night. Elan raised her shield, and flames encircled it, too. 
burning bright, burning undaunted. A vision of old, reborn once more. The cry went down the castle battlements, through the city, along the walls. The queen had come home at last. The queen had come to hold the gate. Chapter 110 Her name was Elan Oshriver Whitethorn Galathenius. And she would not be afraid. Maeve and Erewhon halted. So did the army poised behind them, a final blow of the hammer, ready to land upon a rinth. The magic in her veins was little more than a sputtering ember. But they did not know that. Her shaking hands threatened to drop her weapons, but she held firm. Held fast. Not one more step. Not one more step toward a rinth would she allow them to make. Maeve smiled. What a very long way you've traveled, Elin. Elin only angled Goldrin. Met Erewhon's golden stare. His eyes flared as he took in the sword. Remembered it? Elin bared her teeth. Let the flame she fed into the sword glow brighter. Maeve turned to the Valg King. Shall we, then? But Erewhon looked at Elin. And hesitated. She would not have long. Not long at all until they realized that the power that made him hesitate was no more. But she had not remained outside the southern gate to defeat them. Only to buy time. For those in the city she loved so greatly to get away. To run, and live to fight tomorrow. She had made it home. It was enough. The words echoed with her every breath. Sharpened her vision, steeled her spine. A crown of flame appeared atop her head swirling and unbreakable. She could never win against both of them. But she wouldn't make it easy. Would take one of them down with her, if she could. Or at least slow them enough for the others to enact their plan, to find a way to either halt or defeat them. Even if either option seemed unlikely. Hopeless. But that was why she remained here. To give them that slim shred of hope. That will to keep fighting. At the end of this, if that was all she was able to do against Erewhon and Maeve, she could go to the afterworld with her chin held high. She would not be ashamed to see those she had loved with her heart of wildfire. So Elin sketched a bow to Erewhon and said with every remaining scrap of bravado she possessed, we've met a few times, but never as we truly are. She winked at him. Even as her knees quaked, she winked at him. Pretty as this form is, Erewhon, I think I miss Parrington. Just a little bit. Maeve's nostrils flared. But Erewhon's eyes slitted in amusement. Was it fate, you think, that we encountered each other in ripped hold without recognizing the other? Such casual, easy words from such horrible, corrupt filth. Elin made herself shrug. Fate, or luck. She gestured to the battlefield, her wreck city. This is a far grander setting for our final confrontation, don't you think? Far more worthy of us. Maeve let out a hiss. Enough of this. Elin arched a brow. I've spent the past year of my life ten years, if you consider it another way building to this moment. She clicked her tongue. Forgive me if I want to savor it. To talk with my great enemy for longer than a moment. Erewhon chuckled and the sound grated down her bones. One might think you were trying to delay us, Elin Galathenius. She beckoned to the city walls behind her. From what? The keys are gone, the gods with them. She threw them a smile. You did know that, didn't you? The amusement faded from Erewhon's face. I know. Death such terrible death beckoned in his voice at that. Elin shrugged again. I did you a favor, you know. Maeve murmured, don't let her talk. We end this now. Elin laughed. One would think you were afraid, Maeve. Of any sort of delay. She turned to Erewhon once again. The gods had planned to drag you with them. To rip you apart. Elin gave him a half smile. I asked them not to. So you and I might have this grand duel of ours. How is it that you survived? Maeve demanded. I learned to share, Elin purred. After all this time. 
lies, Maeve spat. I do have a question for you, Elin said, glancing between the two dark rulers, separated from her by only the swirling snow. Will you be sharing power? Now that you're both trapped here. She gestured to Maeve with her burning shield. Last I heard, you were hell-bent on sending him home. And had gathered a little army of healers in Doranel so you might destroy him the moment you got the chance. Erewhon blinked slowly. Elin smiled. What will you do with all those healers now, Maeve? Have you two discussed that? Darkness swirled around Maeve's fingers. I have endured enough of this prattling. I have not, Erewhon said, his golden eyes blazing. Good, Elin said. I was her prisoner, you know. Four months. You'd be surprised how much I picked up. About her husband your brother. About the library in his castle, and how Maeve learned so many interesting things about world walking. Will you share that knowledge, Maeve, or is that not part of your bargain? Doubt. That was doubt beginning to darken Erewhon's eyes. Elin pressed, she wants you out, you know. Gone. What did she even tell you when your word key went missing? Let me guess, the king of Adarlan snuck into Morath, killed the girl you'd enslaved to be your living gate, destroyed your castle, and Maeve arrived just in time to try to stop him but failed? Did you know that she worked with him for days and days? Trying to get the key from you. That is a lie, Maeve snapped. Is it? Shall I repeat some of the things you said in your most private meetings with Lord Erewhon here? The things the King of Adarlan told me. Erewhon's smile grew. You always had a flair for the dramatic. Perhaps you are lying, as my sister claims. Perhaps I am, perhaps I am not. Though I think the truth of your new ally's backstabbing is far more interesting than any lie I might invent. Shall we tell you another truth, then? Maeve crooned. Do you wish to know who killed your parents? Who killed Lady Marion? Elin stilled. Maeve waved a hand to Erewhon. It wasn't him. It wasn't even the king of Adarlan. No, he sent a low-ranking Valg prince to do it. He couldn't even be bothered to go himself. Didn't think anyone important was really necessary to do the deed. Elin stared at the queen. At the Valg king. And then arched a brow. Is that some attempt to unnerve me? You're thousands of years old, and that is all you can think of to say. She laughed again, and pointed to Erewhon with Goldrin. She could have sworn he flinched away from the flaming blade. I feel sorry for you, you know. That you've now shackled yourself to that immortal boar. She sucked on a tooth. And when Maeve sells you out, I suppose I'll feel a little bit sorry for you then, too. See how she talks. Maeve hissed. That has always been her gift to distract and babble while yes, yes. But, as I said, you have the field. There's nothing left that can really stop you. Except for you, Erewhon said. Elin pressed her shield against her chest. I'm flattered you think so. She flicked up her brows. Though I think the 200 healers we've got in the city right now might be a little offended that you forgot them especially when I've watched them so diligently expel your Valg grunts from the hosts they infected? Erewhon stilled. Just a fraction. Or is that another lie? Elin mused. A risky thing for you to do, then to enter the city. My city, I suppose. To see who's waiting for you. I heard you went to an awful lot of trouble to try to kill one of my friends this summer. Silva's heir. If I were you, I might have been more thorough in trying to end her. She's here, you know. Came all this way to see you and repay the favor. Elin let her flame grow brighter as Erewhon again hesitated. Maeve knew. She knows that the healers are here, waiting for you. And will let them at you. Ask her where her owl is the healer she keeps chained to her. To protect her from you. Don't listen to her nonsense, Maeve spat. She even made a bargain, to spare their lives in exchange for ridding her of you. 
Elon waved Goldrin toward Arinth. You're walking into a trap the moment you enter the city. You, and all your little Valg friends. And only Maeve will be left standing in the end, lady of all. Maeve's shadows rose in a wave. I have had enough of this, Elan Galathenius. Elan knew Maeve would go on ahead, without Erewhon. Work without him, if need be. The Dark King looked toward Maeve and seemed to realize it, too. Maeve's black hair flowed around her. Where is the king of Adarlan? We would have words with him. Simmering, vicious rage pulsed from the queen. Elan shrugged. Off fighting somewhere. Likely not bothering to think about you. She inclined her head. A valiant effort, Maeve, to try to divert the conversation. She turned to Erewhon. The healers are waiting for you in there. You'll see I'm telling the truth. Though I suppose it will be too late by then. Doubt. That was indeed doubt in Erewhon's eyes. Just a crack. An open doorway. And it would now be upon Yurin Yurin and the others to seize it. She had not wanted to ask, to plan this. Had not wanted to drag anyone else in. But she trusted them. Yurin, her friends. She trusted them to see this through. When she was gone. She trusted them. Maeve stepped forward. I hope you have enjoyed yourself these past few moments. She bared her two white teeth, all traces of that cool grace vanished. Even Erewhon seemed to blink in surprise at it and again hesitate. As if wondering whether Ilan's words had struck true. I hope you are entertained by your prattling idiocy. Eternally so, Elan said with a mocking bow. I suppose I'll be more entertained when I wipe you from the face of the earth. She sighed skyward. Gods above, what a sight that will be. Maeve extended a hand before her, darkness swirling in her cupped palm. There are no gods left to watch, I'm afraid. And there are no gods left to help you now, Elan Galathenius. Elan smiled, and Goldrin burned brighter. I am a god. She unleashed herself upon them. Rowan pried free the shard of iron from his shoulder as Maeve and Erewhon arrived. As Elan went to meet them before the walls of Arinth. His magic guttered within his veins, but he clapped a hand to his bleeding arm as he ran for the southern gate. Willed the healing. Flesh stung as it knitted together too slowly. Too damn slowly. But he couldn't fly with a shredded wing, as he'd surely have if he shifted now. Block after block, through the city that would have been his home, he ran for the southern gate. He had to get to her. A warning shout from the battlements had him throwing up a shield on instinct. Just as a siege ladder collided with the wall above him. Morith's foot soldiers spilled over it, into the awaiting blades of both Kagan soldier and Bane warrior. Too many. Iron teeth clashed with Krokhans above them iron teeth bearing several Morith foot soldiers apiece. They deposited them on the battlements, on the streets. People screamed. Further into the city, people were screaming. Fleeing. Only a few blocks to the southern gate to Elin. And yet, those screams of terror and pain continued. Families. Children. Home. This was to be his home. Already was, if Elin were with him. He would defend it. Rowan drew his sword and hatchet. Fire burst beyond the walls, bathing the city in gold. She couldn't have more than an ember. Against Erewhon and Maeve, she should already be dead. Yet her flame still raged. The mating bond held strong. White flashed beside him, and then there was Fenris, stained with blood and snarling at the soldiers pouring over the walls. One neared them, and a swipe of a mighty paw was all it took for the grunt to be in pieces. A swipe and then a burst of black wind. Lorcan. They halted for all of a heartbeat. Both males looked to him in question. They knew full well where Ilan was. What the plan had been. Another blast of flame from beyond the walls. But the screams of the innocent in the city. She would never forgive him for it. If he walked away. So Rowan angled his weapons. 
turned toward the screaming. We swore an oath to our queen and this court, he snarled, sizing up the soldiers pouring over the walls. We will not break it. Even three of the great powers of the realm battling before the city gates was not enough to halt the war around them. Morith swarmed, and the exhausted Kaganet army turned to meet them once more. To meet the new horrors that emerged, beasts of snapping teeth and baying howls, Ilkin sailing above them. No sign of the Valg princesses, not yet. But Elide knew they were out there. Morith had emptied its darkest pits for this final destruction. And on the plain, before the gates, fire and darkness blacker than the fallen night ward. Elide didn't know where to look, at the battle between the armies, or the one between Maeve and Erewhon, and Elin. Yurine remained beside her, Lord Darrow, Lysandra, and Evangeline watching with them. A flare of light, an answering wave of darkness. Elin was a fiery whirlwind between Maeve and Erewhon, the fighting swift and brutal. She had no power left. Before the word gate had ripped it from her, Elin might have been able to face one of them and emerge triumphant. But left with a whisper of power, and after a day of wielding it on this battlefield. Maeve and Erewhon didn't know. They didn't know that Elin was only deflecting, not attacking. That this drawn-out dance was not for the spectacle, but because she was buying them all time. Down in the dark beyond the walls, soldiers died and died. And in the city, as siege ladders breached the battlements, Morith surged into Arinth. Still Elin held the gate against Erewhon and Maeve. Didn't let them get one step closer to the city. The final sacrifice of Elin Galathenius for Turason. The moment they realized Elin had nothing left, it would be over. Any amusement they felt at this shallow exchange of power and skill would vanish. Where were the others? Where was Rowan, or Lorcan, or Dorian? Or Fenris and Gavriel? Where were they, or did they not know what occurred before the city gates? Lysandra's breathing was shallow. Nothing the shifter could do nothing against them. And to offer Ilan assistance might be the very thing that made Erewhon and Maeve realize the queen was deceiving them. There was no gentle voice at Elide's shoulder. Not anymore. Never again would she hear that whispering, wise voice guide her. See, Aneath had always murmured to her. See. Elide scanned the field, the city, the queen battling the Valg rulers. Elin did nothing without reason. Had gone out there to buy them time. To wear the Valg rulers down, just a bit. But Elin could not defeat them. There was only one person who could. Elide's eyes landed on Yurine, the healer's face ashen as she watched Elin. The queen would never ask. Never ask that of them, of Yurine. But she might leave a path open. Should they, should Yurine, wish to take it? Noticing her stare, Yurine tore her attention away from the battle. What? Elide looked to Lysandra. Then to the city walls, to the flash of ice and flame along them. She saw what they had to do. Chapter 111 Nesrin had not anticipated the Ilkin. How terrible even a few dozen would be. Nimble and vicious, they swept over the front lines of Morith's teeming ranks. Black as the fallen knight and more than eager to meet the rucks in combat. Sartake had given the order to unleash whatever burning arrows they could find. The heat of one scorched Nesrin's fingers as she picked a target amongst the dark fray and fired. The flame speared into the night, right for an Ilkin poised to tear into a Dargan horse. The arrow struck true, and the Ilkin's shriek reached even Nesrin's ears. The Dargan rider stabbed deep with his solda, and the Ilkin's screeching was cut off. A lucky, brave blow. Nesrin was reaching for another arrow and supplies when the Dargan rider fell. Not dead the Ilkin was not dead, but feigning it. The beautiful horse's scream of pain rent the night as talons ripped open its chest. Another slash and the rider's sternum was shredded. Nesrin fumbled for the flint to light the oil-soaked cloth around the arrowhead. Up and down the battlefield, Ilkin attacked. Riders, both Equine and Rukin, fell. And looming at the back of the battlefield, 
as if waiting for their grand entrance, waiting to pick off what was left of them, a new sort of darkness squatted. The Valg princesses. In their new, Karankui bodies. Erewhon's final surprise. Nesrin aimed and fired her arrow, scanning for Sartake. The prince had led a unit of Rukin deeper into the enemy lines, a battered board, falcon, and urine flanking him. A desperate, final push. One that none of them were likely to walk or fly away from. Yurin's breath was tight in her throat, her heart a wild beat through her entire body, yet the fear she thought she'd yield to had not taken over. Not yet. Not as Lysandra, in rook form, landed on the city walls, steadily enough that Yurin and Elide could quickly dismount. Right where Kaol and Dorian fought, a desperate effort to keep the Valg off the walls. The smallest of their concerns. For nearby, slaughtering their way closer those were Ilkin. Silba saved them all. Kaol saw her first. His eyes flared with pure terror. Get back to the castle. Yurin did no such thing. And as Dorian turned, she said to the king, We have need of you, your majesty. Kaol shoved from the wall, his limp deep. Get back to the castle. Yurin ignored him again. So did Dorian as the king gutted the Valg before him, shoved the demon over the wall, and hurried to Yurin. What is it? Elide pointed to the southern gate. To the fire that flared amid the attacking darkness. Dorian's blood-splattered face drained of color. She has nothing left. We know, Elide said, her mouth tightening. Which is why we need you. Kaol must have realized the plan before his king. Because her husband whirled to her, shield and sword hanging at his sides. You can't. Elide quickly, succinctly, explained their reckless, mad idea. The Lady of Parentha's idea. Yurin tried not to shake. Tried not to tremble as she realized that they were, indeed, about to do this. But Elide merely climbed onto the shifter's leathery back and beckoned the king to follow. And Dorian, to his credit, did not hesitate. Yet Kaol dropped his sword and shield to the bloody stones, and gripped Yurin's face between his hands. You can't, he said again, voice breaking. You can't. Yurin put her hands atop Kaol's and brought them brow to brow. You are my joy, was all she said to him. Her husband, her dearest friend, closed his eyes. The reek of Valg blood and metal clung to him, and yet beneath it beneath it, that was his scent. The smell of home. Kaol at last opened his eyes, the bronze of them so vivid. Alive. Utterly alive. Full of trust, and understanding, and pride. Go save the world, Yurin, he whispered, and kissed her brow. Yurin let that kiss sink into her skin, a mark of protection, of love that she'd carry with her into hell and beyond it. Kaol turned to where Dorian sat with Elide atop the shifter, the love on her husband's face hardening to something fierce and determined. Keep her safe, was all Kaol said. Perhaps the only order, Yurin realized, he would ever give his king. Their king. It was why she loved him. Why she knew that the child in her womb would never spend a single moment wondering if it was loved. Dorian bowed his head. With my life. Then the king offered a hand to help Yurin onto Lysandra's back. Let's make it count. Manon's chest burned with each inhale, but Abraxos flew unfalteringly through the melee. So many. Too many. And the new horrors that Morith had unleashed, the Ilkin amongst them. Screams and blood filled the skies. Crokin and Iron Teeth and Rux those were Rux fought for their very existence. Any hope of victory that Elan Galathenius had brought with her was slipping away. Manon and Abraxos smashed through the Iron Teeth lines, diving to rip apart Ilkin and Foot Soldier. Wind Cleaver was a leaden weight in her hand. She could no longer discern her sweat from blood. The Queen of Teresin had come, an army with her, and it would still not be enough. Lorcan knew Maeve had come. Could feel her presence in his bones, a dark, terrible song through the world. A Valg song. 
he fought far down the city walls, Whitethorn and Fenris nearby, Edian unleashing himself upon soldier after soldier with a ferocity that Lorcan knew came from deep, brutal grief. Gavriel was dead. Had died to give his son and those at the western gate a chance to shut them again. Lorcan tucked away the pang in his chest at the thought of it. That the lion was no more. Which of them would be next? Light flared beyond the wall. Darkness devoured it. Too swiftly, too easily. Elin had to be insane. Must have lost all her wits, if she thought she could take on not just Maeve, but Erewhon, too. Yet Rowan halted. Would have been run through by a Valg soldier if Lorcan hadn't hurled a dagger straight through the demon's face. With a nod to Lorcan and Fenris, Rowan shifted, a hawk instantly soaring over the walls. Lorcan looked to Fenris. Found the male bristling. Aware of the change beyond the walls. It was time. We finish this together, Fenris snarled, and shifted as well, a white wolf leaping clean off the battlements and into the city streets below. Toward the gate. Lorcan glanced at the castle, where he knew Elide was watching. He said his silent farewell, sending what remained of his heart on the wind to the woman who had saved him in every way that mattered. Then Lorcan ran for the gate to the Dark Queen who threatened all he'd come to want, to hope for. He'd come to hope. Had found there was something better out there. Someone better. And he'd go down swinging to defend all of it. It was a dance, and one that Elin had spent her entire life practicing. Not just the movements of her sword, her shield. But the smirk she kept on her face as she met each blast of darkness, as she realized over and over and over who her dance partners were. Where they advanced a step, Elin sent out a plume of fire. Didn't let her own doubt show, didn't dare wonder if they could tell that the fire was mostly color and light. They still dodged it. Avoided it. Waiting for her to plunge down deep, to make that killing blow they anticipated. And though her fire deflected the darkness, though Goldrin was a burning song in her hand, she knew their power would break through soon. The keys were gone. And so was the fire bringer. They would have no use for her. No need to enslave her, save to torment her. It could go either way. Death or enslavement. But there would be no keys, no ability for Erewhon to craft more wordstone, or bring in his Valg to possess others. Elin lunged with Goldrin, spearing for Erewhon as she raised her shield against Maeve. She sent a wave of flame searing for their sides, herding them closer together. Erewhon blasted it back, but Maeve halted. Halted while Elin leaped away a step, panting. The coppery tang of blood coated her mouth. A herald of the looming burnout. Maeve watched Elin's flame sizzle through the snow, melting it down to the dried grasses of their alice. An undulating sea of green in the warmer months. Now a muddy, blood-soaked ruin. For a god, Maeve said, their first words since this dance had begun minutes or hours or an eternity ago, you do not seem so willing to smite us. Symbols have power, Elin panted, smiling as she flipped Goldrin in her hand, the flame hissing through the air. Strike you down too quickly and it will ruin the impact. Elin drew up every shred of swaggering arrogance and winked at Erewhon. She wants me to wear you down, you see. Wants me to tire you, so those healers up in the castle can finish you off with little trouble. Enough. Maeve slammed out her power, and Elin lifted her shield, flame deflecting the onslaught. But barely. The impact rippled into her bones, her blood. Elin didn't let herself so much as wince as she hurled a whip of flame toward Maeve, and the Dark Queen danced back. Just wait she'll spring the trap shut on you soon enough. She is a liar and a fool, Maeve spat. She seeks to drive us apart because she knows we can defeat her together. Again, that dark power rallied around Maeve. The Dark King only stared at Elin with those golden, burning eyes, and smiled. Indeed. You he paused. Those golden eyes lifted above Elin. Above the gates and wall behind her. To something high above. Elin didn't dare to look. 
to take her attention away for that long. To hope. But the gold in Erewhon's eyes glowed. Glowed with rage and perhaps a kernel of fear. He twisted his head toward Maeve. There are healers in that castle. Of course there are, Maeve snapped. Yet Erewhon stilled. There are skilled healers there. Ripe with power. Straight from the Torre Sesma, Elan said, nodding solemnly. As I told you. Erewhon only looked at Maeve. And that doubt flickered again. He glanced to Elan. To her fire, her sword. She bowed her head. Erewhon hissed at Maeve, if she spoke true, you are carrion. And before Elan could muster an ember to strike, a dark, sinewy form swept from the blackness behind Erewhon and snatched him up. An Ilkin. Elan didn't waste her power trying to down them, not with the Ilkin's defenses against magic. Not with Maeve tracking Erewhon as he was carried into the skies. Over the city. Against two Valg rulers, she should have already been dead. Against the female before her, Elan knew it was still just a matter of time. But if Yurin, if her friends, could take down Erewhon. Just us, then, Maeve said, lips curving into that spider's smile. The smile of the horrendous creatures that launched themselves at Arinth. Elan lifted Goldrin again. That's precisely how I wanted it, she said. Truth. But I know your secret, heir of fire, Maeve crooned, and struck again. Chapter 112 Atop the highest tower of the castle of Arinth, on the broad balcony that overlooked the world far below, the healer sent out another flare of power. The white glow seared the night, casting the tower stones in stark relief. A beacon, a challenge to the dark king who battled Elan Galathenius below. Here I am, the power sang through the night. Here I am. Erewhon answered. His rage, his fear, his hatred filled the wind as he swept in, carried in an Ilkin's gangly limbs. He smiled at the young healer whose hands glowed with pure light, as if already tasting her blood. Savoring the destruction of what she offered, the gift she'd been given. His sheer presence set people in the castle below screaming as they fled. Not death incarnate, but something far worse. Something nearly as ancient, and almost as powerful. The Ilkin swept over the tower, dropping him onto the balcony stones. Erewhon landed with the grace of a cat, barely winded as he straightened. As he smiled at her. I never thought you'd do it, you know, Maeve said, her dark power coiling around her as Elin panted. A cramp had begun low in her back and now lashed its way up her spine, down her legs. That you'd be foolish enough to put the keys back into the gate. What happened to that glorious vision you once showed me, Elin? Of you in this very city, your worshipping masses crying your name. Was it simply too dull for you, to be revered? Elin rallied herself with every breath, Goldrin still burning bright. Let her talk let her gloat and ramble. Every second she had to recover, to regain a fraction of her strength, was a blessing. Erewhon had taken the bait, had let the doubt she'd planted take root in his mind. She had known it was only a matter of time until he sensed Yurin's power. She only prayed Yurin Towers was ready to meet him. I had always hoped that you and I were true equals, in a way, Maeve went on. That you, more than Erewhon, understood the true nature of power of what it means to wield it. What a disappointment that deep down, you wished to be so ordinary. The shield had become unbearably heavy. Elan didn't dare look behind her to see where Erewhon had gone. What he was doing. She'd felt Yurin's flare of power, had dared hope it might even be a signal, a lure, but nothing since then. It had drawn Erewhon away, though. It was enough. The darkness around Maeve writhed. The queen who was promised is no more, she said, clicking her tongue. Now you're nothing but an assassin with a crown. And a commoner's gift of magic. Twin whips of brutal power speared for Ilan's either side. Throwing up her shield, swinging Goldrin with her other arm, Ilan deflected, 
flame flashing. The shield buckled, but Goldrin burned steady. But she felt it. The familiar, unending pain. The shadows that could devour. Pressing closer. Eating away at her power. Maeve glanced to the blazing sword. Clever of you, to imbue the sword with your own gifts. No doubt done before you yielded everything to the word gate. A precaution, should I not return, Elan panted. A weapon to kill Valg. We shall see. Maeve struck again. Again. Forcing Elan to concede a step. Then another. Back toward the invisible line she'd drawn between them and the southern gate. Maeve stalked forward, her dark hair and robes billowing. You have denied me two things, Elan Galathenius. The keys I sought. Another whip of power sliced for Elan. Her flame barely deflected it this time. And the great duel I was promised. As if Maeve opened the lid to a chest on her power, plumes of darkness erupted. Elan sliced with Goldrin, the fire within the blade unfaltering. But it was not enough. And as Elan retreated another step, one of those plumes snapped across her legs. Elan couldn't stop the scream that shattered from her throat. She went down, shield scattering in the icy mud. Training kept her fingers clenched on Goldrin. But pressure, unbearable and slithering, began to push into her head. Wake up. The world shifted. Snow replaced by firelight. The ground for a slab of iron. The pressure in her head writhed, and Elan bowed over her knees, refusing to acknowledge it. Real this battle, the snow, and blood, this was real. Wake up, Elan, Maeve whispered. Elan blinked. And found herself in the iron box, Maeve leaning over the open lid. Smiling. We're here, the Fey Queen said. Not Fey. Valg. Maeve was Valg you've been dreaming, Maeve said, running a finger over the mask still clamped to her face. Such strange, wandering dreams, Elan. No. No, it had been real. She managed to lift her head enough to peer down at herself. At the shift and too thin body. The scars still on her. Still there. Not wiped away. No new skin. I can make this easy for you, Maeve went on, brushing Elan's hair back with gentle, loving strokes. Tell me where the word keys are, swear the blood oath, and these chains, this mask, this box, all of it will go away. They hadn't yet begun. To tear her apart. All of it a dream. One long nightmare. The keys remained unbound, the lock unforged. A dream, while they'd sailed here. Wherever here was. What say you, niece? Will you spare yourself? Yield to me. You do not yield. Elan blinked. It's easier, isn't it, Maeve mused, bracing her forearms against the lip of the coffin. To remain here. So you needn't make such terrible choices. To let the others share the burden. Bear its cost. A hint of a smile. Deep down, that's what haunts you. That wish to be free. Freedom she'd known it. Hadn't she? It's what you fear most not me, or Erewhon, or the keys. That your wish to be free of the weight of your crown, your power, will consume you. Embitter you until you do not recognize your own self. Her smile widened. I wish to spare you from that. With me, you shall be free in a way you've never imagined, Elan. I swear it. An oath. She had sworn an oath. To Teresan. To Neomia. To Rowan. Elan closed her eyes, shutting out the queen above her, the mask, the chains, the iron box. Not real. This was not real. Wasn't it? I know you're tired, Maeve went on, gently, coaxingly. You gave and gave and gave, and it was still not enough. It will never be enough for them, will it? It wouldn't. Nothing she had ever done, or would do, would be enough. Even if she saved Teresan, saved Irelia, 
she'd still need to give more, do more. The weight of it already crushed her. Kiern, Maeve said. Strolling footsteps sounded nearby. Scuffing on stone. Tremors shook her, uncontrollable and unsummoned. She knew that gate, knew Cairn's hateful, sneering face appeared beside Maeve's, the two of them studying her. How shall we start, Majesty? He'd spoken the words to her already. They had done this dance so many times. Bile coated her throat. She couldn't stop shaking. She knew what he'd do, how he'd begin. Would never stop feeling it, the whisper of the pain. Kieran ran a hand over the rim of the coffin. I broke some part of you, didn't I? I name you Alentia, spirit that could not be broken. Elan traced her metal encrusted fingers over her palm. Where a scar should be. Where it still remained. Would always remain, even if she could not see it. Niamia Niamia, who had given everything for Ilwi. And yet. And yet, Niamia had still felt the weight of her choices. Still wished to be free of her burdens. It had not made her weak. Not in the slightest. Cairn surveyed her chained body, assessing where he would begin. His breathing sharpened in anticipatory delight. Her hands curled into fists. Iron groaned. Spirit that could not be broken. You do not yield. She would endure it again, if asked. She would do it. Every brutal hour and bit of agony. And it would hurt, and she would scream, but she'd face it. Survive against it? Arobin had not broken her. Neither had Endovire. She would not allow this waste of existence to do so now. Her shaking eased, her body going still. Waiting. Maeve blinked at her. Just once. Elin sucked in a breath sharp and cool. She did not want it to be over. Any of it? Cairn faded into the wind. Then the chains vanished with him. Elin sat up in the coffin. Maeve backed away all of a step. Elin surveyed the illusion, so artfully wrought. The stone chamber, with its braziers and hook from the ceiling. The stone altar. The open door and roar of the river beyond. She made herself look. To face down that place of pain and despair. It would always leave a mark, a stain on her, but she would not let it define her. Hers was not a story of darkness. This would not be the story. She would fold it into herself, this place, this fear, but it would not be the whole story. It would not be her story. How, Maeve simply asked. Elan knew a world and a battlefield raged beyond them. But she let herself linger in the stone chamber. Climbed from the iron coffin. Maeve only stared at her. You should have known better, Elan said, the lingering embers within her shining bright. You, who feared captivity and did all this to avoid it. You should have known better than to trap me. Should have known I'd find a way. How, Maeve asked again. How did you not break? Because I am not afraid, Elin said. Your fear of Erewhon and his brothers drove you, destroyed you. If there was ever anything worthwhile to destroy. Maeve hissed, and Elin chuckled. And then there was your fear of Brannon. Of me. Look what it brought about. She gestured to the room around them, the world beyond it. This is all you'll have left of Doranel. This illusion. Maeve's power rumbled through the room. Elin's lips pulled back from her teeth. You hurt my mate. Hurt the woman you tricked him into thinking was his mate. Killed her, and broke him. Maeve smiled slightly. Yes, and I enjoyed every moment of it. Elin answered the queen's smile with one of her own. Did you forget what I told you on that beach in Ilwi? When Maeve merely blinked at her again, Elin attacked. Blasting with a shield of fire, she drove Maeve to the side and launched a spear of blue flame. Maeve dodged the assault with a wall of dark power, but Elin went on the offensive, striking again and again and again. Those words she'd snarled to Maeve in Ilwi rang between them, I will kill you. And she would. 
for what Maeve had done, to her, to Rowan and Lyria, to Fenris and Canal and so many others, she'd wiped her from memory. Half a thought and Goldrin was again in her hand, the blade singing with flame. Even if it took her last breaths, she'd go down swinging for this. Maeve met her each blow, and they burned and raged through the room. The altar cracked. Melted away. The hook from the ceiling dissolved into molten ore that hissed upon the stones. She blasted away the spot where Fenris had sat, chained by invisible bonds. Again and again, the last embers of her fire rallying, sweat beating on her brow, Elin struck at Maeve. The iron coffin heated, glowing red. Only here, in this illusion, might it do so. Maeve had thought to trap her once more. But the queen would not be the one walking away this time. Elin pivoted, driving Maeve back. Toward the smoldering coffin. Step by step, she pushed her toward it. Herded her. Darkness fanned through the room, blocking the rain of fiery arrows that shot for Maeve, and the queen dared to glance over a shoulder to the red-hot fate that awaited her. Maeve's face went whiter than death. Elin rasped a laugh, and angled Goldrin, gathering her power one last time. But a flicker of motion caught her eye to the right. Elide. Elide stood there, terror written over her features. She reached a hand for Elin in warning, watch Maeve sent a whip of black for the Lady of Peranth. No Elin lunged, fire leaping for Elide, to block that fatal blow. She realized her mistake within a heartbeat. Realized it as her hands passed through Elide's body, and her friend disappeared. An illusion. She had fallen for an illusion, and had left herself open, vulnerable Elin twisted back toward Maeve, flames rising again, but too late. Hands of shadow wrapped around her throat. Immovable. Eternal. Elin arched, gasping for any bit of air as those hands squeezed and squeezed the chamber melted away. The stones beneath her became mud and snow, the roar of the river replaced by the din of battle. They flashed between one heartbeat and the next, between illusion and truth. Warm air for bitter wind, life for sure death. Elin wreathed her hands in flame, ripping at the shadow lashed around her throat. Maeve stood before her, robes billowing as she panted. Here is what shall happen, Elin Galathenius. Plumes of shadow shot for her, snapping and tearing, and no flame, no amount of sheer will could keep them at bay. Not as they tightened, wrenching away any breath to scream. Her fire guttered. You will swear the blood oath to me. And then you and I will fix this mess you've made. You, and the king of Adarlan will fix what you have done. You may be firebringer no longer, but you will still have your uses. A wind kissed with snow brushed past her. No. Another flash of light behind Elin, and Maeve paused. The shadows squeezed, and Elin arched again, a soundless scream breaking through her. You may be asking yourself why I'd ever think you'd agree to it. What I might have against you. A low laugh. The very things that you seek to protect that's what I shall destroy, should you defy me. What is most precious to you? And when I have finished doing that, you will kneel. No, no darkness pulsed from Maeve, and Elin's vision wavered. A wave of ice-kissed wind blasted it back. Just enough for her to get a breath down. To lift her head and see the tattooed hand that now stretched down for her. Reaching for her an offer to rise. Rowan. Behind him, two others appeared. Lorcan and Fenris, the latter in wolf form. The cotter, who had not halted that day to help her at Mist Ward but who did so now. But Rowan kept his hand outstretched to Elin, that offer to stand unfaltering, and didn't take his eyes off Maeve as he bared his teeth and snarled. But it was Fenris who struck first. Who had been waiting for this moment, this opportunity? Fangs bared, fur bristling, he charged at Maeve. Going right for her pale throat. Elin struggled, and Rowan shouted his warning, but too late. Lost in his vengeance, his fury, the white wolf leapt for Maeve. A whip of darkness slashed for him. 
Fenris's yelp of pain echoed through her bones before he hit the ground. Blood leaked from the wound a deep slash down his face. So fast. Barely more than a blink. Rowan's and Lorcan's power surged, rallying to strike. Fenris struggled to his feet. Again, darkness snapped for him. Ripped across his face. As if Maeve knew precisely where to strike. Fenris went down again, blood splattering on the snow. A flash of light, and he shifted into his fey form. What she'd done to his face no. No Elin managed to rally enough air to rasp, run. Rowan glanced at her then. At the warning. Just as Maeve struck once more. As if she had been holding back her power waiting for them. For this. A wave of blackness enveloped her mate. Enveloped Lorcan and Fenris, too. Their magic flared, illumining the darkness like lightning behind a cloud. Yet it was not enough to free themselves from Maeve's grip. Ice and wind blasted against it, again and again. Brutal, calculated strikes. Maeve's power swelled. The ice and wind stopped. The other magic within the darkness stopped. Like it had been swallowed. And then they began screaming. Rowan began screaming. Chapter 113 Erewhon panted as he approached. Healer, he breathed, his unholy power emanating from him like a black aura. She backed away a step, closer to the balcony rail. The Dark King followed her, a predator closing in on long-awaited prey. Do you know how long I have looked for you? The wind tossed his golden hair. Do you even know what you can do? She hesitated, slamming into the balcony rail behind her, the drop so hideously endless. How do you think we took the keys in the first place? A hateful, horrible smile. In my world, your kind exists, too. Not healers to us, but executioners. Death maidens. Capable of healing but also unhealing. Unbinding the very fabric of life. Of worlds. Erewhon smirked. So we took your kind. Used them to unbind the word gate. To rip the three pieces of it from its very essence. Maeve never learned it and never shall. His jagged breathing deepened as he savored each word, each step closer. It took all of them to hew the keys from the gate every one of the healers amongst my kind. But you, with your gifts it would only take you to do it again. And with the keys now returned to the gate. Another smile. Maeve thinks I left to kill you, destroy you. Your little fire queen thought so, too. She could not conceive that I wanted to find you. Before Maeve. Before any harm could come to you. And now that I have. What fun you and I shall have, Yurine Towers. Another step closer. But no more. Erewhon went still. Tried and failed to move. Looked at the stones of the balcony then. At the bloody mark he'd stridden across, too focused on his prey to notice. A word mark. To hold. To trap. The young healer smiled at him, and the white light around her hands winked out as her eyes shifted from gold to sapphire. I'm not Yurine. Erewhon whipped his head to the skies as Lysandra, in rook form, came sweeping around the tower from where she'd been hiding on its other side, Yurine clutched in her talons. Erewhon's power swelled, but Yurine was already glowing, bright as the far-off dawn. Lysandra opened her talons, delicately dropping Yurine to the balcony stones, light streaming off her as she sprinted headfirst to Erewhon. Dorian shifted back into his own body, healing light pouring off him, too, as he encircled his power around the word mark that held Erewhon. The tower door burst open, Elide flying out of it just as Lysandra shifted, landing on a ghost leopard's silent feet upon the balcony. Erewhon didn't seem to know where to look. Not as Dorian sent out a punch of his healing light that knocked him off balance. Not as Lysandra leaped upon the Dark King, pinning him to the stones. Not as Elide, Damaris in her hands, plunged the blade deep through Erewhon's gut, and between the stones below. Erewhon screamed. 
but the sound was nothing compared to what came out of him as urine reached him, hands like burning stars, and slammed them upon his chest. The world slowed and warped. Yet urine was not afraid. Not afraid at all of the blinding white light that erupted from her, searing into Erewhon. He arched, shrieking, but Damaris held him down, that ancient blade unwavering. His dark power rose, a wave to devour the world. Yurin did not let it touch her. Touch any of them. Hope. It was hope that Kaol had said she carried with her. Hope that now grew in her womb. For a better future. For a free world. It was hope that had guided two women at opposite ends of this continent ten years ago. Hope that had guided Yurin's mother to take up that knife and kill the soldier who would have burned Yurin alive. Hope that had guided Marian Locken when she chose to buy a young heir time to run with her very life. Two women, who had never known each other, two women who the world had deemed ordinary. Two women, Josephine and Marian, who had chosen hope in the face of darkness. Two women, in the end, who had bought them all this moment. This one shot at a future. For them, Yurin was not afraid. For the child she carried, she was not afraid. For the world she and Kaol would build for that child, she was not afraid at all. The gods might have been gone, Silva with them, but Yurin could have sworn she felt those warm, gentle hands guiding her. Pushing upon Erewhon's chest as he thrashed, the force of a thousand dark suns trying to rip her apart. Her power tore through them all. Tore and shredded and ripped into him, into the writhing worm that lay inside. The parasite. The infection that fed on life, on strength, on joy. Distantly, far away, Yuri knew she was incandescent with light, brighter than a noontime sun. Knew that the dark king beneath her was nothing more than a writhing pit of snakes, biting at her, trying to poison her light. You have no power over me, Yuri said to him into the body that housed that parasite of parasites. I shall rip you apart, he hissed. Starting with that babe in your thought and Yurin's power flared brighter. Erewhon screamed. The power of creation and destruction. That's what lay within her. Life giver. World maker. Bit by bit, she burned him up. Starting at his limbs, working inward. And when her magic began to slow, Yurin held out a hand. She didn't feel the sting of her palm cutting open. Barely felt the pressure of the call used hand that linked with hers. But when Dorian Havilliard's raw magic barreled into her, Yurin gasped. Gasped and turned into starlight, into warmth and strength and joy. Yurin's power was life itself. Pure, undiluted life. It nearly brought Dorian to his knees as it met with his own. As he handed over his power to her, willingly and gladly, Erewhon prostrate before them. Impaled. The demon king screamed. Glad. He should be glad of that pain, that scream. The end that was surely to come. For Adarlan, for Sorshot, for Gavin, and Elena. For all of them, Dorian let his power flow through Yurin. Erewhon thrashed his power rising only to strike against an impenetrable wall of light. And yet Dorian found himself saying, his name. Yurin, focused upon the task before her, didn't so much as glance his way. But Erewhon, through his screaming, met Dorian's stare. The hatred in the Demon King's eyes was enough to devour the world. But Dorian said, my father's name. His voice did not waver. You took it. He hadn't realized that he wanted it. Needed it, so badly. A pathetic, spineless man, Erewhon seated. As you are tell me his name. Give it back. Erewhon laughed through his screaming. No. Give it back. Yurin looked to him now, doubt in her eyes. Her magic paused just for a heartbeat. Erewhon leapt, his power erupting. Dorian blasted it back and lunged for the demon king. For Damaris. Erewhon's shriek threatened to crack the castle stones as Dorian shoved the blade deeper. Twisted it. 
sent their power funneling down through it. Tell me his name, he panted through his teeth. Yurin, clinging to his other hand, murmured her warning. Dorian barely heard it. Erewhon only laughed again, choking as their power seared him. Does it matter? Yurin asked softly. Yes. He didn't know why, but it did. His father had been wiped from the afterworld, from every realm of existence, but he could still have his name given back to him. If only to repay the debt. If only so Dorian might grant the man some shred of peace. Erewhon's power surged for them again. Dorian and Yurin shoved it back. Now. It had to be now. Tell me his name, Dorian snarled. Erewhon smiled up at him. No. Dorian, Yurin warned. Sweat slid down her face. She couldn't hold him for much longer. And to risk her Dorian sent their power rippling down the blade. Damaris's hilt glowed. Tell me it is your own. Erewhon's eyes widened as the words came out of him. As Damaris drew it from him. But Dorian did not marvel at the sword's power. His father's name. Dorian. I took his name, Erewhon spat, writhing as the words flowed from his tongue under Damaris's power. I wiped it away from existence. Yet he only remembered it once. Only once. The first time he beheld you. Tears slid down Dorian's face at that unbearable truth. Perhaps his father had unknowingly hidden his name within him, a final kernel of defiance against Erewhon. And had named his son for that defiance, a secret marker that the man within still fought. Had never stopped fighting. Dorian. His father's name. Dorian let go of Damaris's hilt. Yurin's breathing turned ragged. Now it had to be now. Even with the Valg King before him, something in Dorian's chest eased. Healed over. So Dorian said to Erewhon, his tears burning away beneath the warmth of their magic. I brought down your keep. He smiled savagely. And now we'll bring you down as well. Then he nodded to Yurin. Erewhon's eyes flared like hot coals. And Yurin unleashed their power once more. Erewhon could do nothing. Nothing against that raw magic, joining with Yurin's, weaving into that world-making power. The entire city, the plain, became blindingly bright. So bright that Elide and Lysandra shielded their eyes. Even Dorian shut his. But Yurin saw it then. What lay at Erewhon's core? The twisted, hateful creature inside. Old and seething, pale as death. Pale, from an eternity in darkness so complete it had never seen sunlight. Had never seen her light, which now scalded his moon-white, ancient flesh. Erewhon writhed, contorting on the ground of whatever this place was inside him. Pathetic, Yurin simply said. Golden eyes flared, full of rage and hate. But Yurin only smiled, summoning her mother's lovely face to her heart. Showing it to him. Wishing she knew what Elide's mother had looked like so she might show him Marion Locken, too. The two women he had killed, directly or indirectly, and never thought twice about it. Two mothers, whose love for their daughters and hope for a better world was greater than any power Erewhon might wield. Greater than any word key. And it was with the image of her mother still shining before him, showing him that mistake he'd never known he made, that Yurin clenched her fingers into a fist. Erewhon screamed. Yurin's fingers clenched tighter, and distantly, she felt her physical hand doing the same. Felt the sting of her nails cutting into her palms. She did not listen to Erewhon's pleas. His threats. She only tightened her fist. More and more. Until he was nothing but a dark flame within it. Until she squeezed her fist, one final time, and that dark flame snuffed out. Yurin had the feeling of falling, of tumbling back into herself. And she was indeed falling, rocking back into Lysandra's furry body, her hands slipping from Dorian's. Dorian lunged for her hand to renew contact, but there was no need. No need for his power, or Yurin's. Not as Erewhon, 
golden eyes open and unseeing as they gazed at the night sky above, sagged to the stones of the balcony. Not as his skin turned gray, then began to wither, to decay. A life rotting away from within. Burn it, Yurin rasped, a hand going to her belly. A pulse of joy, a spark of light, answered back. Dorian didn't hesitate. Flames leaped out, devouring the decaying body before them. They were unnecessary. Before they'd even begun to turn his clothing to ash, Erewhon dissolved. A sagging bit of flesh and brittle bones. Dorian burned him anyway. They watched in silence as the Valg King turned to ashes. As a winter wind swept over the tower balcony, and carried them far, far away. Chapter 114 She was dead. Elin was dead. Her lifeless body had been spiked to the gates of Arinth, her hair shorn to her scalp. Rowan knelt before the gates, the armies of Morath streaming past him. It wasn't real. Couldn't be. Yet the sun warmed his face. The reek of death filled his nose. He gritted his teeth, willing himself out, away from this place. This waking nightmare. It didn't falter. A hand brushed his shoulder, gentle and small. You brought this upon yourself, you know, said a lilting female voice. He knew that voice. Would never forget it. Lyria. She stood behind him, peering up at Elin. Clad in Maeve's dark armor, her brown hair braided back from her delicate, lovely face. You brought it upon her, too, I suppose, his mate his lie of a mate mused. Dead. Lyria was dead, and Elin was the one meant to survive you would pick her over me. Lyria demanded, her chestnut eyes filling. Is that the sort of male you have become? He couldn't find any words, anything to explain, to apologize. Elin was dead. He couldn't breathe. Didn't want to. Canal was smirking at him. Everything that happened to me is because of you. Kneeling on that veranda in Doranel, in a palace he'd hoped to never see again, Fenris fought the bile that rose in his throat. I'm sorry. Sorry, but would you change it? Was I the sacrifice you were willing to make in order to get what you wanted? Fenris shook his head, but it was suddenly that of a wolf the body he had once loved with such pride and fierceness. A wolf's form with no ability to speak. You took everything I ever wanted, his twin went on. Everything. Did you even mourn me? Did it even matter? He needed to tell him tell his twin everything he'd meant to say, wished he'd been able to convey. But that wolf's tongue did not voice the language of men and fey. No voice. He had no voice. I am dead because of you, Canal breathed. I suffered because of you. And I will never forget it. Please. The word burned on his tongue. Please she couldn't endure it. Rowan kneeling there, screaming. Fenry sobbing toward the darkened skies. And Lorcan Lorcan in utter silence, eyes unseeing as some untold horror played out. Maeve hummed to herself. Do you see what I can do? What they are powerless against. Rowan screamed louder, the tendons in his neck bulging. Fighting Maeve with all he had. She couldn't endure it. Couldn't stand it. This was no illusion, no spun dream. This, their pain this was real. Maeve's Valg powers, at last revealed. The same hellish power that the Valg princes possessed. The same power she'd endured. Defeated with flame. But she had no flame to help them. Nothing at all. There's indeed nothing left for you to bargain with, Maeve said simply. But yourself. Anything but this. Anything but this you are nothing. Elide stood before him, the lofty towers of a city Lorcan had never seen, the city that should have been his home, beckoning on the horizon. The wind whipped her dark hair, as cold as the light in her eyes. A bastard born nobody, she went on. Did you think I'd sully myself with you? I think you might be my mate, he rasped. Elide snickered. Mate? 
why would you ever think you were entitled to such a thing after all you have done? It couldn't be real it wasn't real. And yet that coldness in her face, the distance. He'd earned it. Deserved it. Maeve surveyed them, the three males who had been her slaves, lost to her dark power as it ripped through their minds, their memories, and laughed. Pity about Gavriel. At least he fell nobly. Gavriel Maeve turned to her. You didn't know, did you? A click of her tongue. The lion will roar no longer, his life the asking price for defending his cub. Gavriel was dead. She felt the truth in Maeve's words. Let them punch a hole through her heart. You could not save him, it seems, Maeve went on. But you can save them. Fenris screamed now. Rowan had fallen silent, his green eyes vacant. Whatever he beheld had drawn him past screaming, beyond weeping. Pain. Unspeakable, unimaginable pain. As she had endured perhaps worse. And yet. Elan didn't give Maeve time to react. Time to even turn her head as she grabbed Goldrin where it lay beside her and hurled it at the queen. It missed Maeve by an inch, the Valg queen twisting aside before the blade buried itself deep in the snow, steaming where it landed. Still burning. It was all Elan needed. She lashed out, flame spearing into the world. But not for Maeve. It slammed into Rowan, into Fenris, and Lorcan. Struck their shoulders, hard and deep. Burning them. Branding them. Elan was dead. She was dead, and he had failed her. You are a lesser male, Lyria said, still studying the gate where Elan's body swayed. You deserve this. After what was done to me, you deserve this. Elan was dead. He did not wish to live in this world. Not for a heartbeat longer. Elan was dead. And he his shoulder twinged. And then it burned. As if someone had pressed a brand to it. A red hot poker. A flame. He looked down, but beheld no wound. Lyria continued on. You bring only suffering to those you love. The words were distant. Secondary to that burning wound. It cinched him again, a phantom wound, a memory not a memory. Not a memory, but a lifeline thrown into the dark. Into an illusion. An anchor. As he had once anchored her, hauling her from a Valg prince's grip. Elin. His hands curled at his sides. Elin who had known suffering as he did. Who had been shown peaceful lives and still chosen him, exactly as he was, for what they had both endured. Illusions those had been illusions. Rowan gritted his teeth. Felt the thing wrapped around his mind. Holding him captive. He let out a low snarl. She had done this done it before. Torn into his mind. Twisted and taken from him this most vital thing. Elin. He would not let her take it again. Lorcan roared at the brand that shredded through his senses, through Elide's mocking words, through the image of Peranth, the home he wanted so badly and might never see. Roared, and the world rippled. Became snow and darkness and battle. And Maeve. Poised before them, her pale face livid. Her power lunged for him, a striking panther Elide now lay in a grand, opulent bed, her withered hand reaching for his. An aged hand, riddled with marks, the delicate blue veins intertwining like the many rivers around Doranel. And her face. Her dark eyes were filmy, her wrinkles deep. Her thinned hair white as snow. This is a truth you cannot outrun, she said, her voice a croak. A sword above our heads. Her deathbed. That's what this was and the hand he brushed against hers it remained young. He remained young. Bile coated his throat. Please. He put a hand to his chest, as if it stopped the relentless cracking. Faint, throbbing pain answered back. Elide's breaths rasped against his ears. He couldn't watch this, couldn't he dug his hand harder into his chest. To the pain there. Life life was pain. Pain, and joy. Joy because of the pain. 
he saw it in Elide's face. In every line and age mark. In every white hair. A life lived together. The pain of parting because of how wonderful it had been. The darkness beyond thinned. Lorcan dug his hand into the burning wound in his shoulder. Elide let out a hacking cough that wrecked him, yet he took it into his heart, every bit of it. All that the future might offer. It did not frighten him. Again and again, Canal died. Over and over. Canal lay on the floor of the veranda, his blood leaking toward the misty river far below. His fate it should have been his fate. If he walked over the edge of the veranda, into that roaring river, would anyone mark his passing? If he leaped, his brother in his arms, would the river make a quick end for him? He didn't deserve a quick end. He deserved a slow, brutal bloodletting. His punishment, his just reward for what he'd done to his brother. The life he'd allowed to be set in his shadow, had always known remained in his shadow and hadn't tried, not really, to share the light. A burn, violent and unflinching, tore through him. As if someone had shoved his shoulder into a furnace. He deserved it. He welcomed it into his heart. He hoped it would destroy him. Pain. The thing she had dreaded inflicting upon them most, had fought and fought to keep them from. The scent of their burned flesh stung her nostrils, and Maeve let out a low laugh. Was that a shield, Elin? Or were you trying to put them out of their misery? As he kneeled beside her, Rowan's hand twitched at whatever horror he beheld, right over the edge of his discarded hatchet. Pine and snow and the coppery tang of blood blended, rising to meet her as his palm sliced open with the force of that twitch. We can keep at this, you know, Maeve went on. Until a rinth lies in ruin. Rowan stared sightlessly ahead, his palm leaking blood onto the snow. His fingers curled. Slightly. A beckoning gesture, too small for Maeve to note. For anyone to note except for her. Except for the silent language between them, the way their bodies had spoken to each other from the moment they'd met in that dusty alley in Varese. A small act of defiance. As he had once defied Maeve before her throne in Doranel. Fenry sobbed again, and Maeve glanced toward him. Elin slid her hand along Rowan's hatchet, the pain a whisper through her body. Her mate trembled, fighting the mind that had invaded his once more. What a waste, Maeve said, turning back to them. For these fine males to leave my service, only to wind up bound to a queen with hardly more than a few drops of power to her name. Elin closed her hand around Rowan's. A door flung open between them. A door back to himself, to her. His fingers locked around hers. Elin let out a low laugh. I may have no magic, she said, but my mate does. Waiting to strike from the other side of that dark doorway, Rowan hauled Elin to her feet as their powers, their souls, fused. The force of Rowan's magic hit her, ancient and raging. Ice and wind turned to searing flame. Her heart sang, roaring, at the power that flowed from Rowan and into her. At her side, her mate held fast. Unbreakable. Rowan smiled fierce and feral and wicked. A crown of flame, twin to her own, appeared atop his head. As one, they looked to Maeve. Maeve hissed, her dark power massing again. Rowan Whitethorn does not have the brute power that you once did. Perhaps he doesn't, Lorcan said from a step behind them, his eyes clear and free, but together, we do. He glanced to Elin, a hand rising to the angry red burn marring his chest. And beyond us, Elin said, sketching a mark through the snow with the blood she'd spilled her blood, and Rowan's I think they have plenty, too. Light flared at their feet, and Maeve's power surged but too late. The portal opened. Exactly as the word marks in the books Kaol and Yurin had brought from the southern continent had promised. Precisely to where Ilan had intended. Where she had glimpsed as she tumbled back through the word gate. Where she and Rowan had ventured days ago, testing this very portal. The forest glen was silvered in the moonlight, the snows thick. Strange, 
old trees older than even those in Oakwald. Trees that could only be found north of Turason, in the hinterlands beyond. But it was not the trees that made Maeve halt. No, it was the teeming mass of people, their armor and weapons glinting beneath their heavy furs. Amongst them, large as horses, wolves growled. Wolves with riders. Down the battlefield, portal after portal opened. Right where Rowan and the Cotter had drawn them in their own blood as they fought. All to be opened upon this spell. This command. And beyond each portal, that teeming mass of people could be seen. The army. I heard you planned to come here, you see, Elan said to Maeve, Rowan's power a symphony in her blood. Heard you planned to bring the Karankui princesses with you. She smiled. So I thought to bring some friends of my own. The first of the figures beyond the portal emerged, riding a great silver wolf. And even with the furs over her heavy armor, the female's arched ears could be seen. The Fae who dwelled in Turason were not wiped out so thoroughly, Elan said. Lorcan began grinning. They found a new home with the wolf tribe. For those were humans also riding those wolves. As all the myths had claimed. And did you know that while many of them came here with Brannon, there was an entire clan of Fae who arrived from the southern continent? Fleeing you, I think. All of them, actually, don't really like you, I'm sorry to say. More and more Fae and Wolf riders stepped toward the portal, weapons out. Beyond them, stretching into the distance, their host flowed. Maeve backed away a step. Just one. But you know who they hate even more. Elan pointed with Goldrin toward the battlefield. Those spiders. Nesrin Felic told me all about how their ancestors battled them in the southern continent. How they fled you when you tried to keep their healers chained, and then wound up having to battle your little friends. And when they came to Turason, they still remembered. Some of the truth was lost, grew muddled, but they remembered. They taught their offspring. Trained them. The Fae and their wolves beyond the portals now fixed their sights on the Karankui hybrids at last emerging onto the plane. I told them I'd deal with you myself, Elan said, and Rowan chuckled, but the spiders. Oh, the spiders are all theirs. I think they've been waiting a while for it, actually. The Iron Teeth Witches, too. Apparently, the yellow legs weren't very kind to those trapped in their animal forms these ten years. Elan let out a flare of light. The only signal she needed to give. For a people who had asked for only one thing when Elan had begged them to fight, to join this last battle, to return home. To return to Arinth after a decade of hiding. Her flame danced over the battlefield. And the lost Fae of Turason, the fabled wolf tribe who had welcomed and protected them at their sides, charged through the portals. Right into Morith's unsuspecting ranks. Maeve had gone deathly pale. Paled further as magic sparked and surged and those spider hybrids went down, their shrieks of surprise silenced under Astrion blades. Yet Rowan's hand tightened on Elan's, and she peered up at her mate. But his eyes were on Fenris. On the dark power Maeve still had wrapped around him. The male remained sprawled in the snow, his tears silent and unending. His face a bloodied ruin. Through the roar of Rowan's power, Elan felt for the threads leading from her heart, her soul. Look at me. Her silent command echoed down the blood oath to Fenris. Look at me. I suppose you think you can now finish me off in some grand fashion, Maeve said to her and Rowan, that dark power swelling. You, who I have wronged the most. Look at me. His shredded face leaking blood, Fenris looked his eyes blindly turning toward hers. And clearing just slightly. Elan blinked four times. I am here, I am with you. No reply. Do you understand what a Valg Queen is? Maeve asked them, triumph on her face despite the long-lost Fae and Wolf Riders charging onto the battlefield beyond them. I am as vast and eternal as the sea. Erewhon and his brothers sought me for my power. Her magic flowed around her in an unholy aura. You believe yourself to be a god-killer, 
Elan Galathenius. What were they but vain creatures locked into this world? What were they but things your human mind cannot comprehend? She lifted her arms. I am a god. Elan blinked again at Fenris, Rowan's power gathering within her veins, readying for the first and likely final strike they'd be able to land, Lorcan's power rallying beside theirs. Yet over and over, Elan blinked to Fenris, to those half-vacant eyes. I am here, I am with you. I am here, I am with you. A queen had said that to him. In their secret, silent language. During the unspeakable hours of torment, they had said that to each other. Not alone. He had not been alone then, and neither had she. The veranda in Doranel and bloodied snows outside Arinth blended and flashed. I am here, I am with you. Maeve stood there. Before Ilan and Rowan, burning with power. Before Lorcan, his dark gifts a shadow around him. Face so many fey and wolves, some riding them pouring onto the battlefield through holes in the air. It had worked, then. Their mad plan, to be enacted when all went to hell, when they had nothing left. Yet Maeve's power swelled. Elan's eyes remained upon him, anchoring him. Pulling him from that bloodied veranda. To a body trembling in pain. A face that burned and throbbed. I am here, I am with you. And Fenris found himself blinking back. Just once. Yes. And when Elan's eyes moved again, he understood. Elan looked to Rowan. Found her mate already smiling at her. Aware of what likely awaited them. Together, she said quietly. Rowan's thumb brushed against hers. In love and farewell. And then they erupted. Flame, white hot and blinding, roared toward Maeve. But the Dark Queen had been waiting. Twin waves of darkness arched and cascaded for them. Only to be halted by a shield of black wind. Beaten aside. Elan and Rowan struck again, fast as an ASP. Arrows and spears of flame that had Maeve conceding a step. Then another. Lorcan battered her from the side forcing Maeve to retreat another step. I'd say, Elan panted, speaking above the glorious roar of magic through her, the unbreakable song of her and Rowan, that you haven't wronged us the most at all. Like alternating punches, Lorcan struck with them. Fire, then midnight death. Maeve's dark brows narrowed. Elan flung out a wall of flame that pushed Maeve back another step. But him oh, he has a score to settle with you. Maeve's eyes went wide, and she made to turn. But not fast enough. Not fast enough at all as Fenris vanished from where he knelt, and reappeared right behind Maeve. Goldrin burned bright as he plunged it through her back. Into the dark heart within. Chapter 115 Maeve's dark blood leaked onto the snow as she fell to her knees, fingers scrabbling at the burning sword stuck through her chest. Fenry stepped around her, leaving the sword where he'd impaled her as he walked to Elan's side. Embers swirling around her and Rowan, Elan approached the queen. Baring her teeth, Maeve hissed as she tried and failed to pry free the blade. Take it out. Elan only looked to Lorcan. Anything to say? Lorcan smiled grimly, surveying the fey and wolf riders wreaking havoc on the spiders. Long live the queen. The Fairy Queen of the West. Maeve snarled, and it was not the sound of a fae or human. But Valg. Pure, undiluted Valg. Well, look who stopped pretending, Elan said. I will go anywhere you choose to banish me to, Maeve seethed. Just take it out. Anywhere. Elan asked, and let go of Rowan's hand. The lack of his magic, his strength hit her like plunging into an ice-cold lake. But she had plenty of her own. Not magic, never again as it had been, but a strength greater, deeper than that. Fireheart, her mother had called her. Not for her power. The name had never once been about her power. Maeve hissed again, clawing at the blade. Wreathing her fingers in flame, Elan offered her hand to Maeve. 
You came here to escape a husband you did not love. A world you did not love. May paused, studying Elan's hand. The new calluses on it. She winced winced in pain at the blade shredding her heart but not killing her. Yes, May breathed. And you love this world. You love Irelia. Maeve's dark eyes scanned Elan, then Rowan, and Lorcan, before she answered. Yes. In the way that I can love anything. Elan kept her hand outstretched. The unspoken offer in it. And if I choose to banish you, you will go wherever it is we decide. And never bother us again, or any other. Yes, Maeve snapped, grimacing at the immortal blade piercing her heart. The queen bowed her head panting, and took Elan's outstretched hand. Elan drew close. Just as she slid something onto Maeve's finger. And whispered in Maeve's ear, then go to hell. Maeve reared back, but too late. Too late, as the golden ring Silva's ring, a thrill's ring shone on her pale hand. Elan backed to Rowan's side as Maeve began to scream. Screaming and screaming toward the dark sky, toward the stars. Maeve had wanted the ring not for protection against Valg. No, she was Valg. She'd wanted it so that no other might have it. Yet when Elide had given it to Elan, it had not been to destroy a Valg queen. But to keep Elan safe. And Maeve would never know it that gift and power, friendship. What Elan knew had kept the queen before her from becoming a mirror. What had saved her, and this kingdom. Maeve thrashed goldren burning, twin to the light on her finger. Immunity from the Valg. And poison to them. Maeve shrieked, the sound loud enough to shake the world. They only stood amongst the falling snow, faces unmoved, and watched her. Witnessed this death for all those she had destroyed. Maeve contorted, clawing at herself. Her pale skin began to flake away like old paint. Revealing bits of the creature beneath the glamour. The skin she'd created for herself. Elan only looked to Rowan, to Lorcan and Fenris, a silent question in her eyes. Rowan and Lorcan nodded. Fenris blinked once, his mauled face still bleeding. So Elan approached the screaming queen, the creature beneath. Walked behind her and yanked out Goldrin. Maeve sagged to the snow and mud, but the ring continued to rip her apart from within. Maeve lifted dark, hateful eyes as Elan raised Goldrin. Elan only smiled down at her. We'll pretend my last words to you were something worthy of a song. She swung the burning sword. Maeve's mouth was still open in a scream as her head tumbled to the snow. Black blood sprayed, and Elan moved again, stabbing Goldrin through Maeve's skull. Into the earth beneath. Burn her, Lorcan rasped. Rowan's hand, warm and strong, found Elan's again. And when she looked up at him, there were tears on his face. Not at the dead Valg queen before them. Or even at what Elan had done. No, her prince, her husband, her mate, gazed to the south. To the battlefield. Even as their power melted, and she burned Maeve into ash and memory, Rowan stared toward the battlefield where line after line after line of Valg soldiers fell to their knees mid-fight with the Fey and Wolves and Dargan cavalry. Where the rucks flapped in amazement as Ilkin tumbled from the skies, like they had been struck dead. Far out, several shrill screams rent the air then fell silent. An entire army, mid-battle, mid-blow, collapsing. It rippled outward, that collapsing, the stillness. Until all of Morath's host lay unmoving. Until the iron teeth fighting above realized what was happening and veered southward, fleeing from the Rukin and witches who now gave chase. Until the dark shadow surrounding that fallen army drifted away on the wind, too. Elan knew for certain then. Where Erewhon had gone. Who had brought him down at last. So Elan wrenched her sword free of the pile of ashes that had been Maeve. She lifted it high to the night sky, to the stars, and let her cry of victory fill the world. Let the name she shouted ring out, the soldiers on the field, in the city, taking up the call until all of Arinth was singing with it. 
until it reached the shining stars of the Lord of the North gleaming above them, no longer needed to guide her way home. Yurin. 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 Chapter 116 Kaol awoke to warm, delicate hands stroking over his brow, his jaw. He knew that touch. Would know it if he were blind. One moment, he'd been fighting his way down the battlements. The next oblivion. As if whatever surge of power had gone through Yurin had not only weakened his spine, but his consciousness. I don't know whether to start yelling or crying, he said, groaning as he opened his eyes and found Yurin kneeling before him. A heartbeat had him assessing their surroundings, some sort of stairwell, where he'd been sprawled over the lowest steps near a landing. An archway open to the frigid night revealed a starry, clear sky beyond. No wyverns in it. And cheering. Victorious, wild cheering. Not one bone drum. Not one snarl or roar. And Yurin, still stroking his face, was smiling at him. Tears in her eyes. Feel free to yell all you like, she said, some of those tears slipping free. But Kaol just gaped at her as it hit him what, exactly, had happened. Why that surge of power had happened. What this remarkable woman before him had done. For they were calling her name. The army, the people of Arinth were calling her name. He was glad he was sitting down. Even if it did not surprise him one bit that Yurin had done the impossible. Kaol slid his arms around her waist and buried his face in her neck. It's over, then, he said against her skin, unable to stop the shaking that took over, the mix of relief and joy and lingering, phantom terror. Yurin just ran her hands through his hair, down his back, and he felt her smile. It's over. Yet the woman he held, the child growing within her. Erewhon might have been over, his threat and army with it. And Maeve with it, too. But life, Kaol realized life was just beginning. Nesrin didn't believe it. The enemy had just, collapsed. Even the Karankui hybrids. It was as unlikely as the Fae and Wolves who had simply appeared through holes in the world. A missing army, who had wasted no time launching themselves at Morath. As if they knew precisely where and how to strike. As if they had been summoned from the ancient myths of the north. Nesrin alit on the blood-soaked city walls, watching the Rukin and allied witches chase the iron teeth toward the horizon. She would have been with them, were it not for the claw marks surrounding Sokka's eye. For the blood. She had barely the breath to scream for a healer as she dismounted. Barely the breath to unsaddle the rook, murmuring to the bird as she did. So much blood, the gouging lines from the Ilkin sentry deep. No sheen of poison, but are you hurt? Sartek. The prince's eyes were wide, his face bloodied, as he scanned her from head to toe. Behind him, Katara panted on the battlements, her feathers as bloody as her rider. Sartek gripped her shoulders. Are you hurt? She'd never seen such panic in his face. Nesrin only pointed to the now still enemy, unable to find the words. But others did. One word, one name, over and over. Yurin. Healers raced up the battlements, aiming for both rocks, and Nesrin allowed herself to slide her arms around Sartake's waist. To press her face against his armored chest. Nesrin. Her name was a question and a command. But Nesrin only held him tightly. So close. They had come so, so close to utter defeat. Yurin. Yurin. Yurin, the soldiers and people of the city shouted. Sartake ran a hand down her matted hair. You know what victory means, don't you? Nesrin lifted her head, brows narrowing. Behind them, Sokka patiently stood while the healer's magic soothed over his eye. A good night's rest, I hope, she said. Sartake laughed, and pressed a kiss to her temple. It means, he said against her skin, that we are going home. That you are coming home with me. And even with the battle freshly ended, even with the dead and wounded around them, Nesrin smiled. Home. Yes, 
she would go home with him to the southern continent. And to all that waited there. Elan, Rowan, Lorcan, and Fenris lingered on the plain outside the city gates until they were certain the fallen army was not going to rise. Until the Kagan's troops went between the enemy soldiers, nudging and prodding. And received no answer. But they did not behead. Did not sever and finish the job. Not for those with the black rings, or black collars. Those whom the healers might yet save. Tomorrow. That would come tomorrow. The moon had reached its peak when they wordlessly decided that they had seen enough to determine Erewhon's army would never rise again. When the rocks, crockhans, and rebel iron teeth had vanished, chasing the last of the aerial legion into the night. Then Elan turned toward the southern gate to Arinth. As if in answer, it groaned open to meet her. Two arms flung wide. Elan looked to Rowan, their crowns of flame still burning, undimmed. Took his hand. Heart thundering through every bone in her body, Elan took a step toward the gate. Toward Arinth. Toward home. Lorcan and Fenris fell into step behind them. The latter's wounds still leaked down his face, but he had refused Elan and Rowan's offers to heal him. Had said he wanted a reminder. They hadn't dared to ask of what not yet. Elan lifted her chin high, shoulders squaring as they neared the archway. Soldiers already lined either side. Not the Kagan soldiers, but men and women in Turasan armor. And civilians amongst them, to awe and joy in their faces. Elan looked at the threshold of the gate. At the ancient, familiar stones, now caked in blood and gore. She sent a whisper of flame skittering over them. The last dregs of her power. When the fire vanished, the stones were again clean. New. As this city would be made anew, brought to greater heights, greater splendors. A beacon of learning and light once more. Rowan's fingers tightened around hers, but she did not look at him as they crossed the threshold, passing through the gate. No, Elan only looked at her people, smiling broadly and freely, as she entered Arinth, and they began to cheer, welcoming her home at long last. Chapter 117 Edian had fought until the enemy soldier before him had slumped to his knees as if dead. But the man, a black ring on his finger, was not dead at all. Only the demon inside him. And when soldiers of countless nations began to cheer, when word spread that a Tore Sesma healer had defeated Erewhon, Edian simply turned from the battlements. He found him by scent alone. Even in death, the scent lingered, a path that Edian followed through the wrecked streets and throngs of celebrating, weeping people. A lone candle had been lit in the empty barracks room where they'd set his body atop a work table. It was there that Edian knelt before his father. How long he stayed there, head bowed, he didn't know. But the candle had nearly burned down to its base when the door creaked open, and a familiar scent flitted in. She said nothing as she approached on silent feet. Nothing as she shifted and knelt beside him. Lysandra only leaned into him, until Edian put his arm around her, tucking her in tight. Together, they knelt there, and he knew her grief was as real as his. Knew her grief was for Gavriel, but also for his own loss. The years he and his father would not have. The years he'd realized he wanted to have, the stories he wished to hear, the mail he wished to know. And never would. Had Gavriel known that? Or had he fallen believing his son wished nothing to do with him? He couldn't endure it, that potential truth. Its weight would be unbearable. When the candle sputtered out, Lysandra rose, and took him with her. A grand burial, Edian silently promised. With every honor, every scrap of stately regalia that could be found in the aftermath of this battle. He'd bury his father in the royal graveyard, amongst the heroes of Turasan. Where he himself would be buried one day. Beside him. It was the least he could do. To make sure his father knew in the afterworld. They stepped into the street, and Lysandra paused to wipe away his tears. To kiss his cheeks, then his mouth. Loving, gentle touches. 
Edian slid his arms around her and held her tightly under the stars and moonlight. How long they stood in the street, he didn't know. But then a throat cleared nearby, and they peeled apart to turn toward its source. A young man, no older than thirty, stood there. Staring at Lysandra. Not a messenger, or a soldier, though he wore the heavy clothes of the Rukin. There was a self-possessed purpose to him, a quiet sort of strength in his tall frame as he swallowed. Are you are you Lady Lysandra? Lysandra angled her head. I am. The man took a step, and Edian suppressed the urge to push her behind him. To draw his sword on the man whose grey eyes widened and shone with tears. Who smiled at her, broad and joyous. My name is Falcon Enner, he said, putting a hand on his chest. Lysandra's face remained the portrait of wary confusion. Falcon's smile didn't waver. I have been looking for you for a very, very long time. And then it came out, Falcon's tears flowing as he told her. Her uncle. He was her uncle. Her father had been much older than him, but ever since Falcon had learned of her existence, he'd been searching for her. Ten years, he'd hunted for his dead brother's abandoned child, visiting Rift Hold whenever he could. Never realizing that she might have his gifts, too might not wear any of his brother's features. But Nesrin Falik had found him. Or they'd found each other. And then they had figured it out, a bit of chance in this wide world. His fortune as a merchant was hers to inherit, if she would like. Whatever you wish, Falcon said. You shall never want for anything again. Lysandra was crying, and it was pure joy on her face as she flung her arms around Falcon and embraced him tightly. Edian watched, silent and ripped open. Yet happy for her he would always be happy for her, for any ray of light she found. Lysandra pulled away from Falcon, though. Still smiling bright, more lovely than the night sky above. She laced her fingers with Edian's and squeezed tight as she answered her uncle at last, I already have everything I need. Hours later, still sitting on the balcony where Erewhon had been blasted away into nothing, Dorian didn't quite believe it. He kept staring at that spot, the dark stain on the stones, Damaris jutting up from it. The only trace left. His father's name. His own name. The weight of it settled into him, not a wholly unpleasant thing. Dorian flexed his bloodied fingers. His magic lay in scraps, the tang of blood lingering on his tongue. An approaching burnout. He'd never had one before. He supposed he'd better become accustomed to them. On shaking legs, Dorian yanked Damaris from the stones. The blade had turned black as onyx. A swipe of his fingers down the fuller revealed it was a stain that would not be cleansed. He needed to get off this tower. Find Kaol. Find the others. Start helping the injured. And the unconscious soldiers on the plane. The ones who had not been possessed had already fled, pursued by the strange fae who had appeared, the giant wolves and their riders amongst them. He should go. Should leave this place. And yet he stared at the dark stain. All that remained. Ten years of suffering and torment and fear, and the stain was all that remained. He turned the sword in his hand, its weight heavier than it had been. The sword of truth. What had the truth been in the end? What was the truth, even now? Erewhon had done this, slaughtered and enslaved so many, so he might see his brothers again. He wanted to conquer their world, punish it, but he'd wanted to be reunited with them. Millennia apart, and Erewhon had not forgotten his brothers. Longed for them. Would he have done the same for Kaol? For Holland? Would he have destroyed a world to find them again? Damaris's black blade didn't reflect the light. It didn't gleam at all. Dorian still tightened his hand around the golden hilt and said, I am human. It warmed in his hand. He peered at the blade. Gavin's blade. A relic from a time when Adarlan had been a land of peace and plenty. And it would be that way once more. I am human, he repeated, to the stars now visible above the city. 
The sword didn't answer again. As if it knew he no longer needed it. Wings boomed, and then Abraxos was landing on the balcony. A white-haired rider atop him. Dorian stood, blinking, as Man in Black Beak dismounted. She scanned him, then the dark stain on the balcony stones. Her golden eyes lifted to his. Weary, heavy yet glowing. Hello, Prince Ealing, she breathed. A smile bloomed on his mouth. Hello, Witchling. He scanned the skies beyond her for the thirteen, for Asterin Black Beak, undoubtedly roaring her victory to the stars. Manon said quietly, you will not find them. In this sky, or any other. His heart strained as he understood. As the loss of those twelve fierce, brilliant lives carved another hole within him. One he would not forget, one he would honor. Silently, he crossed the balcony. Manon did not back away as he slid his arms around her. I am sorry, he said into her hair. Tentatively, slowly, her hands drifted across his back. Then settled, embracing him. I miss them, she whispered, shuddering. Dorian only held her tighter, and let Manon lean on him for as long as she needed, Abraxo staring toward that blasted bit of earth on the plain, toward the mate who would never return, while the city below celebrated. Elin strode with Rowan up the steep streets of Arinth. Her people lined those streets, candles in their hands. A river of light, of fire, that pointed the way home. Straight to the castle gates. To where Lord Darrow stood, Evangeline at his side. The girl beaming with joy. Darrow's face was stone cold. Hard as the stag horns beyond the city as he remained blocking the way. Rowan let out a low growl, the sound echoed by Fenris, a step behind them. Yet Elin let go of her mate's hand, their crowns of flame winking out as she crossed the last few feet to the castle archway. To Darrow. Silence fell down the illuminated, golden street. He'd deny her entry. Here, before the world, he would throw her out. A final, shaming slap. But Evangeline tugged on Darrow's sleeve as if in reminder. It seemed to spur the old man into speech. My young ward and I were told that when you went to face Erewhon and Maeve, your magic was heavily depleted. It was. And shall remain so forever. Darrow shook his head. Why? Not about her magic being whittled to nothing. But why she had gone to face them, with little more than embers in her veins. Teresin is my home, Elin said. It was the only answer in her heart. Darrow smiled just a bit. So it is. He bowed his head. Then his body. Welcome, he said, then added as he rose, Your Majesty. But Elin looked to Evangeline, the girl still beaming. Win me back my kingdom, Evangeline. Her order to the girl, all those months ago. And she didn't know how Evangeline had done it. How she had changed this old lord before them. Yet there was Darrow, gesturing to the gates, to the castle behind him. Evangeline winked at Elin, as if in confirmation. Elin just laughed, taking the girl by the hand, and led that promise of Teresen's bright future into the castle. Every ancient, scarred hall brought her back. Snatched her breath away and set her tears running. At the memory, how they'd been. At how they now appeared, sad and worn. And what they would become once more. Darrow led them toward the dining hall, to find whatever food and refreshment might be available in the dead of night, after such a battle. Yet Elin took one look at who waited in the faded grandeur of the great hall, and forgot about her hunger and thirst. The entire hall grew silent as she hurtled for Edian, and flung herself onto him so hard they rocked back a step. Home at last, home together. She had the vague sense of Lysandra joining Rowan and the others behind her, but didn't turn. Not as her own joyous laugh died upon seeing Edian's haggard, weary face. The sorrow in it. She laid a hand on his cheek. I'm sorry. Edian closed his eyes, leaning into her touch, mouth wobbling. She didn't remark on the shield across his back her father's shield. 
she had never realized he carried it. Instead she asked softly, where is he? Wordlessly, Edian led her from the dining hall. Down the winding passageways of the castle, their castle, to a small, candlelit room. Gavriel had been laid on a table, a wool blanket obscuring the body she knew was shredded beneath. Only his handsome face visible, still noble and kind in death. Edian lingered by the doorway as Elin walked up to the warrior. She knew Rowan and the others stood by him, her mate with a hand on Edian's shoulder. New Fenris and Lorcan bowed their heads. She stopped before the table where Gavriel had been laid. I wished to wait to offer you the blood oath until after your son had taken it, she said, her quiet voice echoing off the stones. But I offer it to you now, Gavriel. With honor, and gratitude, I offer you the blood oath. Her tears plopped onto the blanket covering him, and she wiped one away before drawing her dagger from the sheath at her side. She pulled his arm from beneath the covering. A flick of the blade had her slicing his palm open. No blood flowed beyond a slight swelling. Yet she waited until a drop slid to the stones. Then opened up her own arm, dipped her fingers into the blood, and let three drops fall into his mouth. Let the world know, Elin said, voice breaking, that you are a male of honor. That you stood by your son, and this kingdom, and helped to save it. She kissed the cold brow. You are blood sworn to me. And you shall be buried here as such. She pulled away, stroking his cheek once. Thank you. It was all there was left to say. When she turned away, it was not Edian alone who had tears streaking down his face. She left them there. The Cotter, the Brotherhood, who now wished to say farewell in their own way. Fenris, his bloodied face still untended, sank to a knee beside the table. A heartbeat later, Lorcan did the same. She'd reached the door when Rowan knelt as well. And began to sing the ancient words the words of mourning, as old and sacred as Teresin itself. The same prayers she'd once sung and chanted while he'd tattooed her. Rowan's clear, deep voice filling the room, Elin looped her arm through Edian's, and let him lean on her as they walked back to the great hall. Darrow called me your majesty, she said after a minute. Edian slid his red-rimmed eyes to her. But a spark lit them just a bit. Should we be worried? Elin's mouth curved. I thought the same damn thing. So many witches. There were so many witches, Iron Teeth, and Crokin, in the halls of the castle. Elide scanned their faces as she worked with the healers in the great hall. A dark lord and dark queen defeated yet the wounded remained. And since she had strength left in her, she would help in whatever way she could. But when a white-haired witch limped into the hall, an injured Crokin slung between her and another witch Elide did not recognize. Elide was halfway across the space, across the hall where she had spent so many happy childhood days, by the time she realized she'd moved. Manon paused at the sight of her. Gave the wounded Crokin over to her sister in arms. But made no move to approach. Elide saw the sorrow on her face before she reached her. The dullness and pain in the golden eyes. She went still. Who? Manon's throat bobbed. All. All of the thirteen. All those fierce, brilliant witches. Gone. Elide put a hand to her heart, as if it could stop it from cracking. But Manon closed the distance between them, and even with that grief in her battered, bloodied face, she put a hand on Elide's shoulder. In comfort. As if the witch had learned how to do such things. Elide's vision stung and blurred, and Manon wiped away the tear that escaped. Live, Elide, was all the witch said to her before striding out of the hall once more. Live. Manon vanished into the teeming hallway, braid swaying. And Elide wondered if the command had been meant for her at all. Hours later, Elide found Lorcan standing vigil by Gavriel's body. When she'd heard, she had wept for the male who had shown her such kindness. And from the way Lorcan knelt before Gavriel, she knew he had just finished doing the same. Sensing her in the doorway, Lorcan rose to his feet, 
an aching, slow movement of the truly exhausted. There was indeed sorrow on his face. Grief and regret. She held open her arms, and Lorcan's breath heaved out of him as he pulled her against him. I hear, he said unto her hair, that you're to thank for Erewhon's destruction. Elide withdrew from his embrace, leading him from that room of sadness and candlelight. Yurin is, she said, walking until she found a quiet spot near a bank of windows overlooking the celebrating city. I just came up with the idea. Without the idea, we'd be filling the bellies of Erewhon's beasts. Elide rolled her eyes, despite all that had happened, all that lay before them. It was a group effort, then. She bit her lip. Peranth have you heard anything from Peranth? A rook rider arrived a few hours ago. It is the same there as it is here, with Erewhon's demise, the soldiers holding the city either collapsed or fled. Its people have reclaimed control, but those who were possessed will need healers. A group of them will be flown over tomorrow to begin. Relief threatened to buckle her knees. Thank Anith for that. Or Silva, I suppose. They're both gone. Thank yourself. Elide waved him off, but Lorcan kissed her. When he pulled away, Elide breathed, what was that for? Ask me to stay, was all he said. Her heart began racing. Stay, she whispered. Light, such beautiful light filled his dark eyes. Ask me to come to Peranth with you. Her voice broke, but she managed to say, come to Peranth with me. Lorcan nodded, as if in answer, and his smile was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. Ask me to marry you. Elide began crying, even as she laughed. Will you marry me, Lorcan Salvatera? He swept her up into his arms, raining kisses over her face. As if some final, chained part of him had been freed. I'll think about it. Elide laughed, smacking his shoulder. And then laughed again, louder. Lorcan set her down. What? Elide's mouth bobbed as she tried to stop her laughing. It's just. I'm Lady of Peranth. If you marry me, you will take my family name. He blinked. Elide laughed again. Lord Lorcan Lorcan. It sounded just as ridiculous coming out. Lorcan blinked at her, then howled. She'd never heard such a joyous sound. He swept her up in his arms again, spinning her. I'll use it with pride every damn day for the rest of my life, he said into her hair, and when he set her down, his smile had vanished. Replaced by an infinite tenderness as he brushed back her hair, hooking it over an ear. I will marry you. Elide Lockin. And proudly call myself Lord Lorcan Lockin, even when the whole kingdom laughs to hear it. He kissed her, gently and lovingly. And when we are wed, he whispered, I will bind my life to yours. So we will never know a day apart. Never be alone, ever again. Elide covered her face with her hands and sobbed, at the heart he offered, at the immortality he was willing to part with for her for them. But Lorcan clasped her wrists, gently prying her hands from her face. His smile was tentative. If you would like that, he said. Elide slid her arms around his neck, feeling his thundering heartbeat raging against hers, letting his warmth sink into her bones. I would like that more than anything, she whispered back. Chapter 118 Yurine slumped onto the three-legged stool amid the chaos of the Great Hall. The story was familiar, though the setting slightly altered, another mighty chamber turned into a temporary sickbay. Dawn was not far off, yet she and the other healers kept working. Those bleeding out wouldn't be able to survive without them. Human and fey and witch and wolf Yurine had never seen such an assortment of people in one place. Elide had come in at some point, glowing despite the injured around them. Yurine supposed they all wore that same smile. Though her own had faltered in the past hour, as exhaustion settled in. She'd been forced to rest after dealing with Erewhon, and had waited until her well of power had refilled only just enough to begin working again. She couldn't sit still. 
not when she saw the thing that lay beneath Erewhon's skin every time she closed her eyes. Forever gone, yes, but... She wondered when she'd forget him. The dark, oily feel of him. Hours ago, she hadn't been able to tell if the retching that ensued was from the memory of him or the babe in her womb. You should find that husband of yours and go to bed, Hafiza said, hobbling over and frowning. When was the last time you slept? Yurin lifted her head heavier than it had been minutes ago. The last time you did, I'd wager. Two days ago. Hafiza clicked her tongue. Slaying a dark lord, healing the wounded. It's a wonder you're not unconscious right now, Yurin. Yurin was about to be, but the disapproval in Hafiza's voice steeled her spine. I can work. I'm ordering you to find that dashing husband of yours and go to sleep. On behalf of the child in your womb. Ach. When the healer on high put it like that. Yurin groaned as she stood. You're merciless. Hafiza just patted her shoulder. Good healers know when to rest. Exhaustion makes for sloppy decisions. And sloppy decisions cost lives, Yurin finished. She lifted her eyes toward the vaulted ceiling high, high above. You never stop teaching, do you? Hafiz's mouth cracked into a grin. This is life, Yurin. We never stop learning. Even at my age. Yurin had long suspected that love of learning was what had kept the healer on high young at heart all these years. She just smiled back at her mentor. But Hafiz's eyes softened. Grew contemplative. We will remain for as long as we are needed until the Kagan soldiers can be transported home. We'll leave some behind to tend for any remaining wounded, but in a few weeks, we will go. Yurin's throat tightened. I know. And you, Hafiza went on, taking her hand, will not return with us. Her eyes burned, but Yurin whispered, No, I won't. Hafiza squeezed Yurin's fingers, her hand warm. Strong as steel. I shall have to find myself a new heir apparent, then. I'm sorry, she whispered. Whatever for. Hafiza chuckled. You have found love, and happiness, Yurin. There is nothing more that I could ever wish for you. Yurin wiped away the tear that slipped out. I just I don't want you to think I wasted your time Hafiza crowed with laughter. Wasted my time? Yurin Towers Yurin Westfall. The ancient woman cupped Yurin's face with her strong, ancient hands. You have saved us all. Yurin closed her eyes as Hafiza pressed a kiss to her brow. A blessing and a farewell. You will stay in these lands, Hafiza said, her smile unwavering. But even with the ocean dividing us, we will remain linked here. She touched her chest, right over her heart. And no matter the years, you will forever have a place at the Toure. Always. Yurin put a shaking hand over her own heart and nodded. Hafiza squeezed her shoulder and made to walk back to her patients. But Yurin said, what if Hafiza turned, brows rising? Yes. Yurin swallowed. What if, once I have settled in a darlin, and had this babe? When the time is right, what if I established my own Torre here? Hafiza cocked her head, as if listening to the cadence of the statement while it echoed into her heart. A Torre Sesma in the north. Yurin went on, in a darlin. In ripped hold. A new Torre to replenish what Erewhon destroyed. To teach the children who might not realize they have the gift, and those who will be born with it. Because many of the face streaming in from the battlefield were descendants of the healers who had gifted the Torre women with their powers long ago. Perhaps they would wish to help again. Hafiza smiled anew. I like that idea very much, Yurin Westfall. With that, the healer on high walked back into the fray of healing and pain. But Yurin remained standing there, a hand drifting to the slight swelling in her belly. And she smiled broad and unfalteringly at the future that opened before her, bright as the oncoming dawn. Sunrise was near, yet Manon could not sleep. Had not bothered to find a place to rest, 
not while the crockhans and iron teeth remained injured, and she had not yet finished her count of how many had survived the battle. The war. There was an empty space inside her where twelve souls had once burned fiercely. Perhaps that was why she had not found her bed, not even when she knew Dorian had likely procured sleeping arrangements. Why she still lingered in the airy, Abraxos dozing beside her, and stared out at the silent battlefield. When the bodies were cleared, when the snows melted, when the spring came, would a blasted bit of earth linger on the plain before the city? Would it forever remain as such, a marker of where they fell? We have a final count, Bronwyn said behind her, and Manon found the Crokin and Glenis emerging from the tower stairwell, Petra at their heels. Manon braced herself for it as she waved a hand in silent request. Bad. But not as bad as it could have been. When Manon opened her eyes, the three of them only stared at her. Iron Teeth and Crokin, standing together in peace. As allies. We'll collect the dead tomorrow, Manon said, her voice low. And burn them at moonrise. As both Crockhans and Iron Teeth did. A full moon tomorrow the mother's womb. A good moon to be burned. To be returned to the three-faced goddess, and reborn within that womb. And after that? Petra asked. What then? Manon looked from Petra to Glenis and Bronwyn. What should you like to do? Glenis said softly, go home. Manon swallowed. You and the Crockhans may leave whenever you to the wastes, Glenis said. Together. Manon and Petra swapped a glance. Petra said, we cannot. Bronwyn's lips curved upward. You can. Manon blinked. And blinked again as Bronwyn extended a fist toward Manon and opened it. Inside lay a pale purple flower, small as Manon's thumbnail. Beautiful and delicate. A bastion of crockhans just made it here a bit late, but they heard the call and came. All the way from the wastes. Manon stared and stared at that purple flower. They brought this with them. From the plain before the witch city. The barren, bloodied plain. The land that had yielded no flowers, no life beyond grass and moss and Manon's sight blurred, and Glenis took her hand, guiding it toward Bronwyn's before the witch tipped the flower into Manon's palm. Only together can it be undone, Glenis whispered. Be the bridge. Be the light. A bridge between their two peoples, as Manon had become. A light as the Thirteen had exploded with light, not darkness, in their final moments. When iron melts, Petra murmured, her blue eyes swimming with tears. The Thirteen had melted that tower. Melted the iron teeth within it. And themselves. When flowers spring from fields of blood, Bronwyn went on. Manon's knees buckled as she stared out at that battlefield. Where countless flowers had been laid atop the blood and ruins where the Thirteen had met their end. Glenis finished, let the land be witness. The battlefield where the rulers and citizens of so many kingdoms, so many nations, had come to pay tribute. To witness the sacrifice of the Thirteen and honor them. Silence fell, and Manon whispered, her voice shaking as she held that small, impossibly precious flower in her palm, and returned home. Glenis bowed her head. And so the curse is broken. And so we shall go home together as one people. The curse was broken. Manon just stared at them, her breathing turning jagged. Then she roused Abraxos, and was in the saddle within heartbeats. She did not offer them any explanation, any farewell, as they leaped into the thinning night. As she guided her wyvern to the bit of blasted earth on the battlefield. Right to its heart. And smiling through her tears, laughing in joy and sorrow, Manon laid that precious flower from the wastes upon the ground. In thanks and in love. So they would know, so Asterin would know, in the realm where she and her hunter and child walked hand in hand, that they had made it. That they were going home. Elin wanted to, but could not sleep. Had ignored the offers to find her a room, a bed, in the chaos of the castle. Instead, she and Rowan had gone to the great hall, to talk to the wounded, 
to offer what help they could for those who needed it most. The lost Fae of Teresan, their giant wolves and adopted human clan with them, wanted to speak to her as much as the citizens of Arinth. How they had found the wolf tribe a decade ago, how they'd fallen in with them in the wilds of the mountains and hinterlands beyond, was a tale she'd soon learn. The world would learn. Their healers filled the great hall, joining the Tore women. All descended from those in the southern continent and apparently trained by them, too. Dozens of fresh healers, each bearing badly needed supplies. They fell seamlessly into work alongside those from the Ture. As if they had been doing so for centuries. And when the healers both human and fey had shooed them out, Elin had wandered. Each hallway and floor, peering into the room so full of ghosts and memory. Rowan had walked at her side, a quiet, unfaltering presence. Level by level they went, rising ever higher. They were nearing the top of the North Tower when dawn broke. The morning was brutally cold, even more so atop the tower standing high over the world, but the day would be clear. Bright. So there it is, Elin said, nodding toward the dark stain on the balcony stones. Where Erewhon met his end at the hands of a healer. She frowned. I hope it will wash off. Rowan snorted, and when she looked over her shoulder, the wind whipping her hair, she found him leaning against the stairwell door, his arms crossed. I mean it, she said. It'll be odious to have his mess there. And I plan to use this balcony to sun myself. He'll ruin it. Rowan chuckled, and pushed off the door, going to the balcony rail. If it doesn't wash off, we'll throw a rug over it. Elin laughed, and joined him, leaning into his warmth as the sun gilded the battlefield, the river, the staghorns. Well, now you've seen every hall and room and stairwell. What do you make of your new home? A little small, but we'll manage. Elin nudged him with an elbow, and jerked her chin to the nearby western tower. Where the north tower was tall, the western tower was wide. Grand. Near its upper levels, Hanging over the perilous drop, a walled stone garden glowed in the sunlight. The king's garden. Queens, she supposed. There had been nothing left but a tangle of thorns and snow. Yet she still remembered it, when it had belonged to Orlan. The roses and drooping latticework of wisteria, the fountains that had streamed right over the edge of the garden and into the open air below, the apple tree with blossoms like clumps of snow in the spring. I never realized how convenient it would be for Fleetfoot, she said of the secret, private garden. Reserved only for the royal family. Sometimes just for the king or queen themselves. To not have to run down the tower stairs every time she needs to pee. I'm sure your ancestors had canine bathroom habits in mind when they built it. I would have, Elin grumbled. Oh, I believe it, Rowan said, smirking. But can you explain to me why we're not in there right now, sleeping? In the garden. He flicked her nose. In the suite beyond the garden. Our bedroom. She'd led him quickly through the space. Still preserved well enough, despite the disrepair of the rest of the castle. One of the Adarlanian cronies had undoubtedly used it. I want it cleaned of any trace of Adarlan before I stay in there, she admitted. Ah. She heaved a breath, sucking down the morning air. Elin heard them before she saw them, scented them. And when they turned, they found Lorcan and Elide walking onto the tower balcony, Edian, Lysandra and Fenris trailing. Ren Alsbrook, tentative and wary-eyed, emerged behind them. How they'd known where to find them, why they'd come, Elin had no idea. Fenris's wounds had closed at least, though twin. Red scars slashed from his brow to his jaw. He didn't seem to notice or care. She also didn't fail to note the hand Lorcan kept on Elide's back. The glow on the lady's face. Elin could guess well enough what that glow was from. Even Lorcan's dark eyes were bright. It didn't stop Elin from catching Lorcan's stare. And giving him a warning look that conveyed everything she didn't bother to say, if he broke the lady of Parentha's heart, She'd flambe him. 
and would invite Man and Blackbeak to roast some dinner over his burning corpse. Lorcan rolled his eyes, and Elan deemed that acceptance enough as she asked them all, did anyone bother to sleep? Only Fenris lifted his hand. Edian frowned at the dark stain on the stones. We're putting a rug over it, Elan told him. Lysandra laughed. Something tacky, I hope. I'm thinking pink and purple. Embroidered with flowers. Just what Erewhon would have loved. The females gaped at them, ran blinking. Elide ducked her head as she chuckled. Rowan snorted again. At least this court won't be boring. Elan put a hand on her chest, the portrait of outrage. You were honestly worried it would be. Gods help us, Lorcan grumbled. Elide elbowed him. Edian said to Ran, the young lord lingering by the archway, as if still debating making a quick exit, now's the chance to escape, you know. Before you get sucked into this endless nonsense. But Ran's dark eyes met Elan's. Scan them. She'd heard about Murdha. Knew now was not the time to mention it, the loss dimming his eyes. So she kept her face open. Honest. Warm. We could always use one more to partake in the nonsense, Elan said, an invisible hand outstretched. Ren scanned her again. You gave up everything and still came back here. Still fought. All of it for Teresan, she said quietly. Yes, I know, Ren said, the scar down his face stark in the rising Sunday I understand that now. He offered her a small smile. I think I might need a bit of nonsense myself, after this war. Edian muttered, you'll regret saying that. But Elan sketched a bow. Oh, he certainly will. She smirked at the males assembled. I swear to you, I won't bore you to tears. A queen's oath. And what will not boring us entail, then? Edian asked. Rebuilding, Elide said. Lots of rebuilding. Trade negotiations, Lysandra said. Training a new generation in magic, Elan went on. Again, the males blinked at them. Elan angled her head, blinking right back at them. Don't you lot have anything worthwhile to contribute? She clicked her tongue. Three of you are ancient as hell, you know. I'd have expected better from cranky old bastards. Their nostrils flared. Edian grinned. Ren wisely clamping his lips together to keep from doing the same. But Fenris said, Four. Four of us are old as hell. Elan arched a brow. Fenris smirked, the movement stretching his scars. Vaughn is still out there. And now free. Rowan crossed his arms. He'll never be caught again. But Fenris' smirk turned knowing. He pointed to the Camp Fey army on the plain, the wolves and humans amongst them. I have a feeling someone down there might know where we could start. He glanced at Elan. If you'd be amenable to another cranky old bastard joining this court. Elan shrugged. If you can convince him, I don't see why not. Rowan smiled at that, and scanned the sky, as if he could see his missing friend soaring there. Fenris winked. I promise he's not as miserable as Lorcan. Elide smacked his arm, and Fenris darted away, hands up as he left. You'll like him, he promised Elin. All the ladies do, he added with another wink to her, Lysandra, and Elide. Elin laughed, the sound lighter, freer than any she had made, and faced the stirring kingdom. We promised everyone a better world, she said after a moment, voice solemn. So we'll start with that. Starting small, Fenris said. I like it. Elan smirked at him. I rather like the whole let's vote on the word keys thing we did. So we'll start with more of that, too. Silence. Then Lysandra asked, voting on what? Elan shrugged, sliding her hands into her pockets. Things. Edian arched a brow. Like dinner. Elan rolled her eyes. Yes, on dinner. Dinner by committee. Elide coughed. I think Elan means on vital things. 
on how to run this kingdom. Your queen, Lorcan said. What's there to vote on? People should have a say in how they are governed. Policies that impact them. They should have a say in how this kingdom is rebuilt. Elin lifted her chin. I will be queen, and my children. Her cheeks heated as she smiled toward Rowan. Our children, she said a bit softly, will rule. One day. But Teresin should have a voice. Each territory, regardless of the lords who rule it, should have a voice. One chosen by its people. The cotter looked toward one another then. Rowan said, there was a kingdom to the east. Long ago. They believed in such things. Pride glowed in his eyes, brighter than the dawn. It was a place of peace and learning. A beacon in a distant and violent part of the world. Once the library of Arinth is rebuilt, we'll ask the scholars to find what they can about it. We could reach out to the kingdom itself, Fenris said. See if some of their scholars or leaders might want to come here. To help us. He shrugged. I could do it. Travel there, if you wish. She knew he meant it to travel as their emissary. Perhaps to work through all he'd seen and endured. To make peace with the loss of his brother. With himself. She had a feeling the scars down his face would only fade when he willed it. But Elin nodded. And while she'd gladly send Fenris wherever he wished the library, she blurted. Rowan only smiled and the Royal Theatre. There was no theatre not like in Ripthold. Rowan's smile grew. There will be. Elin waved him off. Need I remind you that despite winning this war, we are no longer flush with gold. Rowan slid his arm around her shoulders. Need I remind you that since you beheaded Maeve, I am a prince of Doranel once again, with access to my assets and estates? And that with Maeve outed as an imposter, Half of her wealth goes to you. And the other to the White Thorns. Elin blinked at him slowly. The others grinned. Even Lorcan. Rowan kissed her. A new library and royal theater, he murmured onto her mouth. Consider them my mating presents to you, Fireheart. Elin pulled back, scanning his face. Read the sincerity and conviction. And, throwing her arms around him, Laughing to the lightning sky, she burst into tears. It was to be a day for many meetings, Elin decided as she stood in a near-empty, dusty chamber and smiled at her allies. Her friends. Ansel of Briarcliff, bruised and scratched, smiled back. Your shifter was a good liar, she said. I'm ashamed I didn't notice it myself. Prince Galen, equally battered, huffed a laugh. In my defense, I've never met you. He inclined his head to Elin. So, hello, cousin. Elin, leaning against the half-decayed desk that served as the lone piece of furniture in the room, smirked at him. I saw you from a distance once. Galen's Oshriver eyes sparked. I'm going to assume it was during your former profession and thank you for not killing me. Elin chuckled, even as Rolf rolled his eyes. Yes, privateer. Rolf waved a tattooed hand, blood still clinging beneath his nails. I'll refrain from commenting. Elin smirked. You're the heir to the Mycenaean people, she said. Petty squabbles are now beneath you. Ansel snorted. Rolf shot her a look. What do you intend to do with them now? Elin asked. She supposed the rest of her court should have been here, but when she'd dispatched Evangeline to round up their allies, she'd opted to let them rest. Rowan, at least, had gone to seek out Endymion and Selene. The latter, it seemed, was about to learn a great deal regarding her own future. The future of Doranel. Rolf shrugged. We'll have to decide where to go. Whether to return to Skull's Bay, or... His sea-green eyes narrowed. Or... Elin asked sweetly. Or decide if we'd rather rebuild our old home in Ilium. Why not decide yourself? Ansel asked. Rolf waved a tattooed hand. They offered up their lives to fight in this war. 
they should be able to choose where they wish to live after it. Wise, Elin said, clicking her tongue. Rolf stiffened, but relaxed upon seeing the warmth in her gaze. But she looked to Ilya's, the assassin's armor dented and scratched. Did you speak at all this entire war? No, Ansel answered for him. The mute master's son looked to the young queen. Held her stare. Elin blinked at the look that passed between them. No animosity no fear. She could have sworn Ansel flushed. Sparing her old friend, Elin said to them all, Thank you. They faced her again. She swallowed, and put a hand over her heart. Thank you for coming when I asked. Thank you on behalf of Teresen. I am in your debt. We were in your debt, Ansel countered. I wasn't, Rolf muttered. Elin flashed him a grin. We're going to have fun, you and I. She surveyed her allies, worn and battle-weary, but still standing. All of them still standing. I think we're going to have a great deal of fun. At midday, Elin found Manon in one of the witch's aries, Abraxos staring out toward the battlefield. Bandages peppered his sides and wings. And covered the former wing leader. Queen of the Crockhans and the Iron Teeth, Elin said by way of greeting, letting out a low whistle that had Manon turning slowly. Elin picked at her nails. Impressive. Yet the face that turned toward her exhaustion. Grief. I heard, Elin said quietly, lowering her hands but not approaching. Manon said nothing, her silence conveying everything Elin needed to know. No, she was not all right. Yes, it had destroyed her. No, she did not wish to talk about it. Elin only said, thank you. Manon nodded vaguely. So Elin walked toward the witch, then past her. Right to where Abraxos sat, gazing toward their Alice. The blasted patch of earth. Her heart strained at the sight of it. The wyvern and the earth and the witch behind her. But Elin sat down beside the wyvern. Brushed a hand over his leathery head. He leaned into her touch. There will be a monument, she said to Abraxos, to Manon. Should you wish it, I will build a monument right there. So no one shall ever forget what was given. Who we have to thank. Wind sang through the tower, hollow and brisk. But then footsteps crunched in hay, and Manon sat down beside her. Yet Elin did not speak again, and asked no more questions. And Manon, realizing it, let her shoulders curve inward, let her head bow. As she might never do with anyone else as no one else might understand the weight they both bore. In silence, the two queens stared toward the decimated field. Toward the future beyond it. Chapter 119 It took ten days for everything to be arranged. Ten days to clear out the throne room, to scrub the lower halls, to find the food and cooks they needed. Ten days to clean the royal suite, to find proper clothing, and outfit the throne room in queenly splendor. Evergreen garlands hung from the pews and rafters, and as Rowan stood on the dais of the throne room, monitoring the assembled crowd, he had to admit that Lysandra had done an impressive job. Candles flickered everywhere, and fresh snow had fallen the night before, covering the scars still lingering from battle. At his side, Edian shifted on his feet, Lorcan and Fenris looking straight ahead. All of them washed and brushed and wearing clothes that made them look, princely. Rowan didn't care. His green jacket, threaded with silver, was the least practical thing he'd ever donned. At his side, at least, he bore his sword, Goldrin hanging from his other hip. Thankfully, Lorcan looked as uncomfortable as he did, clad in black. If you wore anything else, Elin had tutate to Lorcan, the world would turn on its head. So burial black it is. Lorcan had rolled his eyes. But Rowan had glimpsed Elide's face when he'd spotted her and Lysandra in the hall off the throne room moments before. Had seen the love and desire when she beheld Lorcan in his new clothes. And wondered how soon this hall would be hosting a wedding. A glance at Edian, clad in Teresan green as well, and Rowan smiled slightly. 
two weddings, likely before the summer. Though neither Lysandra nor Edian had mentioned it. The last of their guests finished filing into the packed space, and Rowan surveyed the rulers and allies seated in the front rows. Ansel of Briarcliff kept fidgeting in her equally new pants and jacket, Rolf draping an arm over the pew behind her as he smirked at her discomfort. Ilias, clad in the white, layered clothes of his people, sat on Ansel's other side, the portrait of unruffled calm. A row ahead, Galen lounged in his princely regalia, chin high. He winked as his Ashriver eyes met Rowan's. Rowan only inclined his chin back to the young man. And then inclined it toward his cousins, Enda and Selene, seated near the aisle, the latter of whom had needed a good few hours of sitting in silence when Rowan had told her that she was now Queen of Doranel. The Fey Queen of the East. His silver-haired cousin hadn't dressed for her new title today, though like Enda, she had opted for whatever clothing was the least battle-worn. Such changes would come to Doranel once Rowan knew he could not predict. The Whitethorn family would rule, Mora's line restored to power at last, but it would remain up to them, up to Selene, how that reign would shape itself. How the Fae would choose to shape themselves without a dark queen lording over them. How many of those Fae would choose to stay here, in Turasin, would remain to be seen. How many would wish to build a life in this war-torn kingdom, to opt for years of hard rebuilding over returning to ease and wealth. The Fey warriors he'd encountered these two weeks had given him no indication, yet he'd seen a few of them gaze toward the staghorns, toward Oakwald, with longing. As if they, too, heard the wild call of the wind. Then there was the other factor, the Fey who had dwelled here before Teresen's fall. Who had answered Elin's desperate plea, and had returned to their hidden home amongst the wolf tribe in the hinterlands to prepare for the journey here. To return to Teresen at last. And perhaps bring some of those wolves with them. He'd worked to make this kingdom worthy of their return. Worthy of all who lived here, human or fey or which kind. A kingdom as great as it had once been greater. As great as what dwelled in the far south, across the narrow sea, proof that a land of peace and plenty could exist. The Kaganet royals had told him much about their kingdom these days their policies, their peoples. They now sat together on the other side of the throne room, Kaol and Dorian with them. Yurin and Nesrin also sat there, both lovely in dresses that Rowan could only assume had been borrowed. There were no shops open and none with supplies. Indeed, it was a miracle that any of them had clean clothes at all. Manon, at least, had refused finery. She wore her witch leathers though her crown of stars lay upon her brow, casting its light upon Petra Blueblood and Bronwyn Crokin, seated on her either side. Edian's swallow was audible, and Rowan glanced to the open doors. Then to where Lord Darrow stood beside the empty throne. Not an official throne just a larger, finer chair that had been selected from the sad lot of candidates. Darrow, too, stared toward the open doors, face impassive. Yet his eyes glowed. The trumpets rang out. A four-note summons. Repeated three times. Pews groaned as everyone twisted to the doors. Behind the dais, hidden beyond a painted wooden screen, a small group of musicians began playing a processional. Not the grand, sprawling orchestra that might accompany an event of this magnitude, but better than nothing. It didn't matter anyway. Not as Elide appeared in a lilac gown, a garland of ribbons atop her braided black hair. Every step limped, and Rowan knew it was because she had asked Lorcan not to brace her foot. She'd wanted to make this walk down the long aisle on her own two feet. Poised and graceful, the Lady of Peranth kept her shoulders thrown back as she clutched the bouquet of holly before her and walked to the dais. Lady of Peranth and one of Elin's handmaidens. For today. For Ilan's coronation. Elide was halfway down the aisle when Lysandra appeared, clad in green velvet. People murmured. Not just at the remarkable beauty, but what she was. The shapeshifter who had defended their kingdom. Had helped take down Erewhon. Lysandra's chin remained high as she glided down the aisle, and Edian's own head lifted at the sight of her. The Lady of Caravur. 
Then came Evangeline, green ribbons in her red-gold hair, beaming, those scars stretched wide in utter joy. The young lady of Aaron. Darrow's ward. Who had somehow melted the Lord's heart enough for him to convince the other lords to agree to this. To Elan's right to the throne. They had delivered the documents two days ago. Signed by all of them. Elide took up a spot on the right side of the throne. Then Lysandra. Then Evangeline. Rowan's heart began thundering as everyone gazed down the now empty aisle. As the music rose and rose, the song of Teresen ringing out. And when the music hit its peak, when the world exploded with sound, regal, and unbending, she appeared. Rowan's knees buckled as everyone rose to their feet. Clad in flowing, gauzy green and silver, her golden hair unbound, Elan paused on the threshold of the throne room. He had never seen anyone so beautiful. Elan gazed down the long aisle. As if weighing every step she would take to the dais. To her throne. The entire world seemed to pause with her, lingering on that threshold. Shining brighter than the snow outside, Elan lifted her chin and began her final walk home. Every step, every path she had taken, had led here. The faces of her friends, her allies, blurred as she passed by. To the throne that waited. To the crown Darrow would place upon her head. Each of her footfalls seemed to echo through the earth. Elan let some of her embers stream by, bobbing in the wake of her gown's train as it flowed behind her. Her hands shook, yet she clutched the bouquet of evergreen tighter. Evergreen for the eternal sovereignty of Teresen. Each step toward that throne loomed and yet beckoned. Rowan stood to the right of the throne, teeth bared in a fierce grin that even his training could not contain. And there was Edian at the throne's left. Head high and tears running down his face, the sword of Arenth hanging at his side. It was for him that she then smiled. For the children they had been, for what they had lost. What they now gained. Elan passed Dorian and Kaol, and threw a nod their way. Winked at Ansel of Briarcliff, dabbing her eyes on her jacket sleeve. And then Elan was at the three steps of the dais, and Darrow strode to their edge. As he had instructed her last night, as she had practiced over and over in a dusty stairwell for hours, Elan ascended the three steps and knelt upon the top one. The only time in her reign that she would ever bow. The only thing she would ever kneel before. Her crown. Her throne. Her kingdom. The hall remained standing, even as Darrow motioned them to sit. And then came the words, uttered in the old language. Sacred and ancient, spoken flawlessly by Darrow, who had crowned Orlan himself all those decades ago. Do you offer your life, your body, your soul to the service of Teresen? She answered in the old language, as she had also practiced with Rowan last night until her tongue turned leaden. I offer all that I am and all that I have to Teresen. Then speak your vows. Elan's heart raced, and she knew Rowan could hear it, but she bowed her head and said, I, Elan Oshriver Whitethorn Galathenius, swear upon my immortal soul to guard, to nurture, and to honor Teresen from this day until my very last. Then so it shall be, Darrow responded, and reached out a hand. Not to her, but to Evangeline, who stepped forward with a green velvet pillow. The crown atop it? Adarlan had destroyed her antler throne. Had melted her crown. So they had made a new one. In the ten days since it had been decided she was to be crowned here, before the world, they had found a master goldsmith to forge one from the remaining gold they'd stolen from the barrow in Wendland. Twining bands of it, like woven antlers, rose to uphold the gem in its center. Not a true gem, but one infinitely more precious. Darrow had given it to her himself. The cut bit of crystal that contained the sole bloom of King's Flame from Orlan's reign. Even amid the shining metals of the crown, the red and orange blossom glowed like a ruby, dazzling in the light of the morning sun as Darrow lifted the crown from the pillow. He raised it toward the shaft of light pouring through the bank of windows behind the dais. The ceremony chosen for this time, this ray of sun. This blessing, from Mela herself. And though the Lady of Light was forever gone, 
Elin could have sworn she felt a warm hand on her shoulder as Darrow held up the crown to the sun. Could have sworn she felt them all standing there with her, those whom she had loved with her heart of wildfire. Whose stories were again inked upon her skin. And as the crown came down, as she braced her head, her neck, her heart, Elin let her power shine. For those who had not made it, for those who had fought, for the world watching. Darrow set the crown upon her head, its weight heavier than she'd thought. Elin closed her eyes, letting that weight, that burden, and gift, settle into her. Rise, Darrow said, Elin Oshriver Whitethorn Galathenius, Queen of Teresan. She swallowed a sob. And slowly, her breathing steady despite the heartbeat that threatened to leap out of her chest, Elin rose. Darrow's gray eyes were bright. Long may she reign. And as Elin turned, the call went up through the hall, echoing off the ancient stones and into the gathered city beyond the castle. Hail, Elin. Queen of Teresan. The sound of it from Rowan's lips, from Edian's, threatened to send her to her knees, but Elin smiled. Kept her chin high and smiled. Darrow gestured to the awaiting throne, to those last two steps. She would sit and the ceremony would be done. But not yet. Elin turned to the left. Toward Edian. And said quietly, but not weakly, this has been years from the day you were born, Prince Edian. Edian went still as Elin pushed back the gauzy sleeve of her gown, exposing her forearm. Edian's shoulders shook with the force of his tears. Elin didn't fight hers as she asked, lips wobbling, will you swear the blood oath to me? Edian just fell to his knees before her. Rowan silently handed her a dagger, but Elin paused as she held it over her arm. You fought for Teresan when no one else would. Against all odds, beyond all hope, you fought for this kingdom. For me. For these people. Will you swear to continue to do so, for as long as you draw breath? Edian's head bowed as he breathed, yes. In this life, and in all others, I will serve you. And Teresan. Elin smiled at Edian, at the other side to her fair coin, and sliced open her forearm before extending it to him. Then drink, prince. And be welcome. Gently, Edian took her arm and set his mouth to her wound. And when he withdrew, her blood on his lips, Elin smiled down at him. You said you wanted to swear it before the entire world, she said so only he could hear. Well, here you go. Edian choked out a laugh and rose, throwing his arms around her and squeezing tightly before he backed to his place on the other side of the throne. Elin looked to Darrow, still waiting. Where were we? The old lord smiled slightly and gestured to the throne. The last piece of the ceremony. Then lunch, Fenris muttered, sighing. Elin suppressed her smile and took the two steps to the throne. She halted again as she turned to sit. Halted at the small figures who poked their heads around the throne room doors. A small gasp escaped her, enough that everyone turned to look. The little folk, people murmured, some backing away as small figures darted through the shadows down the aisle, wings rustling and scales gleaming. One of them approached the dais, and with spindly greenish hands, laid their offering at her feet. A second crown. Mab's crown. Taken from her saddlebags wherever they had wound up after the battle. With them, it seemed. As if they would not let it be lost once more. Would not let her forget. Elin picked up the crown they had laid at her feet, gaping toward the small gathering who clustered in the shadows beyond the pews, their dark, wide eyes blinking. The fairy queen of the west, Elide said softly, though all heard. Elin's fingers trembled, her heart filling to the point of pain, as she surveyed the ancient, glimmering crown. Then looked to the little folk. Yes, she said to them. I will serve you, too. Until the end of my days. And Elin bowed to them then. The near invisible people who had saved her so many times, and asked for nothing. The Lord of the North, who had survived, as she had, against all odds. 
who had never forgotten her. She would serve them, as she would serve any citizen of Teresan. Everyone on the dais bowed, too. Then everyone in the throne room. But the little folk were already gone. So she placed Mab's crown atop the one of gold and crystal and silver, the ancient crown settling perfectly behind it. And then finally, Elin sat upon her throne. It weighed on her, nestled against her bones, that new burden. No longer an assassin. No longer a rogue princess. And when Elin lifted her head to survey the cheering crowd, when she smiled, Queen of Teresan and the Fairy Queen of the West, she burned bright as a star. The ritual was not over. Not yet. As the bells rang out over the city, declaring her coronation, the gathered city beyond cheered. Elin went to greet them. Down to the castle gates, her court, her friends, following her, the crowd from the throne room behind. And when she stopped at the sealed gates, the ancient, carved metal looming, the city and world awaiting beyond it, Elin turned toward them. Toward all those who had come with her, who had gotten them to this day, this joyous ringing of the bells. She beckoned her court forward. Then smiled at Dorian and Kaol, at Yurin and Nesrin and Sartake and their companions. And beckoned them forward, too. Brows rising, they approached. But Elin, crowned and glowing, only said, Walk with me. She gestured to the gates behind her. All of you. This day did not belong to her alone. Not at all. And when they all balked, Elin walked forward. Took Yurin Westfall by the hand to guide her to the front. Then Man and Blackbeak. Elide Locken. Lysandra. Evangeline. Nesrin Felic. Bort and Hassar and Ansel of Briarcliff. All the women who had fought by her side, or from afar. Who had bled and sacrificed and never given up hope that this day might come. Walk with me, Elin said to them, the men and males falling into step behind. My friends. The bell still ringing, Elin nodded to the guards at the castle gates. They opened at last, and the roar from the gathered crowds was loud enough to rattle the stars. As one, they walked out. Into the cheering city. Into the streets, where people danced and sang, where they wept and clasped their hands to their hearts at the sight of the parade of waving, smiling rulers and warriors and heroes who had saved their kingdom, their lands. At the sight of the newly crowned queen, joy lighting her eyes. A new world. A better world. Chapter 120 Two days later, Nesrin Felik was still recovering from the ball that had lasted until dawn. But what a celebration it had been. Nothing as majestic as anything in the southern continent, but the sheer joy and laughter in the great hall, the feasting and dancing. She would never forget it, as long as she lived. Even if it might take her until her dying day to feel rested again. Her feet still ached from dancing and dancing and dancing, and she'd spotted both Elin and Lysandra grousing about it at the breakfast table just an hour ago. The queen had danced, though a sight Nesrin would never forget, either. The first dance had been Elin's to lead, and she had selected her mate to join her. Both queen and consort had changed for the party, Elin into a gown of black threaded with gold, Rowan into black embroidered with silver. And what a pair they had been, alone on the dance floor. The queen had seemed shocked delighted as the fay prince had led her into a waltz and had not faltered a step. So delighted that she'd crowned them both with flames. That had been the start of it. The dance had been. Nesrin had no words for the swiftness and grace of their dance. Their first as queen and consort. Their movements had been a question and answer to each other, and when the music had sped up, Rowan had spun and dipped and twirled her, the skirts of her black gown revealing Elin's feet, clad in golden slippers. Feet that moved so quickly over the floor that embers sparked at her heels. Trailed in the wake of her sweeping dress. Faster and faster, Elin and Rowan had danced, spinning, 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 the queen glowing like she'd been freshly forged as the music gathered into a clashing close. And when the waltz slammed into its triumphant, final note, 
they halted a perfect, sudden stop. Right before the queen threw her arms around Rowan and kissed him. Nesrin was still smiling about it, sore feet and all, as she stood in the dusty chamber that had become the headquarters for the Kaganet royals, and listened to them talk. The healer on high says it will be another five days until the last of our soldiers are ready, Prince Kashin was saying to his siblings. To Dorian, who had been asked into this meeting today. And you will depart then? Dorian asked, smiling a bit sadly. Most of us, Sartek said, smiling with equal sadness. For it was friendship that had grown here, even in war. True friendship, to last beyond the oceans that would separate them once more. Sartek said to Dorian, we asked you here today because we have a rather unusual request. Dorian lifted a brow. Sartek winced. When we visited the Firian Gap, some of our Rukin found wyvern eggs. Untended and abandoned. Some of them now wish to stay here. To look after them. To train them. Nesrin blinked, right along with Dorian. No one had mentioned this to her. I, I thought the Rukin never left their Ares, Nesrin blurted. These are young riders, Sartek said with a smile. Only two dozen. He turned to Dorian. But they begged me to ask you if it would be permissible for them to stay when we leave. Dorian considered. I don't see why they couldn't. Something sparked in his eyes, an idea formed and then set aside. I would be honored, actually. Just don't let them bring the wyverns home, Hassar groused. I never want to see another wyvern for as long as I live. Kashin patted her on the head. Hassar snapped her teeth at him. Nesrin chuckled, but her smile faded as she found Dorian smiling sadly at her, too. I think I'm about to lose another captain of the guard, the king of Adarlan said. Nesrin bowed her head. I. She hadn't anticipated having this conversation. Not right now, at least. But I will be glad, Dorian went on, to gain another queen whom I can call friend. Nesrin blushed. It deepened as Sartek smirked and said, not queen. Empress. Nesrin cringed, and Sartek laughed, Dorian with him. Then the king embraced her tightly. Thank you, Nesrin Felik. For all you have done. Nesrin's throat was too tight to speak, so she hugged Dorian back. And when the king left, when Kashin and Hassar went to find an early lunch, Nesrin turned to Sartek and cringed again. Empress? Really? Sartek's dark eyes glittered. We won the war, Nesrin Felik. He tugged her close. And now we shall go home. She'd never heard such beautiful words. Kaol stared at the letter in his hands. It had arrived an hour ago, and he still hadn't opened it? No, he'd just taken it from the messenger one of the fleet of children commanded by Evangeline and brought it back to his bedroom. Seated on his bed, the candlelight flickering through the worn chamber, he still couldn't bring himself to crack the red wax seal. The doorknob twisted, and Urine slipped in, tired but bright-eyed. You should be sleeping. So should you, he said with a pointed look to her abdomen. She waved him off, as easily as she'd waved off the titles of savior, and hero of Irelia. As easily as she waved off the odd stares, the tears, when she strode by. So Kaol would be proud for both of them. Would tell their child of her bravery, her brilliance. What's that letter? She asked, washing her hands, then her face, in the ewer by the window. Beyond the glass, the city was silent sleeping, after a long day of rebuilding. The wild men of the fangs had even remained to help, an act of kindness that Kaol would ensure did not go unrewarded. Already, he had looked into where he might expand their territory and the peace between them and Aniel. Kaol swallowed. It's from my mother. Yurine paused, her face still dripping. You're. Why haven't you opened it? He shrugged. Not all of us are courageous enough to take on Dark Lords, you know. Yurine rolled her eyes, dried her face, and plopped down on the bed beside him. 
Do you want me to read it first? He did. Damn him, but he did. Wordlessly, Kaol handed it to her. Yurin said nothing as she opened the sealed parchment, her golden eyes darting over the inked words. Kaol tapped a finger on his knee. After a long day of healing, he knew better than to try to pace. Had barely made it back here with the cane before he'd sunk to the bed. Yurin put a hand to her throat as she turned the page, read the back. When she lifted her head again, tears slid down her cheeks. She handed him the letter. You should read it yourself. Just tell me. He'd read it later. Just tell me what it says. Yurin wiped at her face. Her mouth trembled, but there was joy in her eyes. Pure joy. It says that she loves you. It says that she has missed you. It says that if you and I are amenable to it, she would like to come live with us. Your brother Terran, too. Kaol reached for the letter, scanning the text. Still not believing it. Not until he read, I have loved you from the moment I knew you were growing in my womb. He didn't stop his own tears from falling. Your father informed me of what he did with my letters to you. I informed him I shall not be returning to Aniel. Yurin leaned her head against his shoulder while he read and read. The years have been long, and the space between us distant, his mother had written. But when you are settled with your new wife, your babe, I would like to visit. To stay for longer than that, tear in with me. If that would be all right with you. Tentative, nervous words. As if his mother, too, did not quite believe that he'd agree. Kaol read the rest, swallowing hard as he reached the final lines. I am so very proud of you. I have always been, and always will be. And I hope to see you very soon. Kaol set down the letter, wiped at his cheeks, and smiled at his wife. We're going to have to build a bigger house, he said. Yurin's answering grin was all he'd hoped for. The next day, Dorian found Kaol and Yurin in the sick bay that had been moved to the lower levels, the former in his wheelchair, helping his wife tend to a wounded croaken, and beckoned them to follow. They did, not asking him questions, until he found Manon atop the airy. Saddling Abraxos for his morning ride. Where she'd been each day, falling into a routine that Dorian knew was as much to keep the grief at bay as it was to maintain order. Manon stilled as she beheld them, Brows narrowing. She'd met Kaol and Yurin days ago, their reunion quiet but not chilly, despite how poorly Kaol's first encounter with the witch had gone. Yurin had only embraced the witch, Manon holding her stiffly, and when they'd pulled apart, Dorian could have sworn some of the paleness, the gauntness, had vanished from Manon's face. Dorian asked the witch queen, Where do you go, when everyone leaves? Manon's golden eyes didn't leave his face. He hadn't dared ask her. They hadn't dared speak of it. Just as he had not yet spoken of his father, his name. Not yet. To the wastes, she said at last. To see what might be done. Dorian swallowed. He'd heard the witches, both Iron Teeth and Croc Hans, talking about it. Had felt their growing nerves and excitement. And after. There will be no after. He smiled slightly at her, a secret, knowing smile. Won't there be? Manon asked, what is it that you want? You, he almost said. All of you. But Dorian said, a small faction of the Rookin are remaining in Adarlan to train the Wyvern hatchlings. I want them to be my new aerial legion. And I would like you, and the other iron teeth, to help them. Kaol coughed, and gave him a look as if to say, you were going to tell me this when? Dorian winked at his friend and turned back to Manon. Go to the wastes. Rebuild. But consider it coming back. If not to be my crowned rider, then to train them. He added a bit softly, and to say hello every now and then. Manon stared at him. He tried not to look like he was holding his breath, like this idea he'd had mere minutes ago in the Kaganet Royal's chamber wasn't coursing through him, bright and fresh. Then Manon said, 
it is only a few days by wyvern from the waist's ripped hold. Her eyes were wary, and yet yet that was a slight smile. I think Bronwyn and Petra will be able to lead if I occasionally slip away. To help the Rookin. He saw the promise in her eyes, in that hint of a smile. Both of them still grieving, still broken in places, but in this new world of theirs, perhaps they might heal. Together. You could just marry each other, Yurin said, and Dorian whipped his head to her, incredulous. It'd make it easier for you both, so you don't need to pretend. Kaol gaped at his wife. Yurin shrugged. And be a strong alliance for our two kingdoms. Dorian knew his face was red when he turned to Manon, apologies and denials on his lips. But Manon smirked at Yurin, her silver white hair lifting in the breeze, as if reaching for the united people who would soon soar westward. That smirk softened as she mounted Abraxos and gathered up the reins. We'll see, was all man in black beak, high queen of the Krokhans and iron teeth, said before she and her wyvern leaped into the skies. Kaol and Yurin began bickering, laughing as they did, but Dorian strode to the edge of the airy. Watched that white-haired rider and the wyvern with silver wings become distant as they sailed toward the horizon. Dorian smiled. And found himself, for the first time in a while, looking forward to tomorrow. Chapter 121 Rowan knew this day would be hard for her. For all of them, who had become so close these weeks and months. Yet a week after Ilan's coronation, they gathered again. This time not to celebrate, but to say farewell. The day had dawned, clear and sunny, yet still brutally cold. As it would be for a time. Elin had asked them all to stay last night. To wait out the winter months and depart in the spring. Rowan knew she'd been aware her request was unlikely to be granted. Some had seemed inclined to think it over, but in the end, all but Rolf had decided to go. Today is one. Scattering to the four winds. The iron teeth and crockhans had left before first light, vanishing swiftly and quietly. Heading westward toward their ancient home. Rowan stood beside Elin in the castle courtyard, and he could feel the sorrow and love and gratitude that flowed through her as she took them in. The Kaganet royals and Rookin had already said their goodbyes, bored the most reluctant to say farewell, and Elin's embrace with Nesrin Felik had been long. They had whispered together, and he'd known what Elin offered, companionship, even from thousands of miles away. Two young queens, with mighty kingdoms to rule. The healers had gone with them, some on horseback with the Dargan, some in wagons, some with the Rukin. Yurin Westfall had sobbed as she had embraced the healers, the healer on high, one last time. And then sobbed into her husband's arms for a good while after that. Then Ansel of Briarcliff, with what remained of her men. She and Elin had traded taunts, then laughed, and then cried, holding each other. Another bond that would not be so easily broken despite the distance. The silent assassins left next, Ilya smiling at Elin as he rode off. Then Prince Galen, whose ships remained under the watch of Ravi and Sol in Surya and who would ride there before departing to Wendlin. He had embraced Edian, then clasped Rowan's hand before turning to Elin. His wife, his mate, his queen had said to the prince, You came when I asked. You came without knowing any of us. I know I've already said it, but I will be forever grateful. Galen had grinned. It was a debt long owed, cousin. And one gladly paid. Then he, too, rode off, his people with him. Of all the allies they'd cobbled together, only Rolf would remain for the winter, as he was now Lord of Ilium. And Falcon Enner, Lysandra's uncle, who wished to learn what his niece knew of shape-shifting. Perhaps build his own merchant empire here and assist with those foreign trade agreements they'd need to quickly make. More and more departed under the winter sun until only Dorian, Kaol, and Yurin remained. Yurin embraced Elide the two women swearing to write frequently. Yurin, wisely, just nodded to Lorcan, then smiled at Lysandra, Edian, Ren, and Fenris before she approached Rowan and Elin. 
Irene remained smiling as she looked between them. When your first child is near, send for me and I will come. To help with the birth. Rowan didn't have words for the gratitude that threatened to bow his shoulders. Fay births. He didn't let himself think of it. Not as he hugged the healer. For a moment, Elin and Yurin just stared at each other. We're a long way from Inish, Yurin whispered. But lost no longer, Elin whispered back, voice breaking as they embraced. The two women who had held the fate of their world between them. Who had saved it? Behind them, Kaol wiped at his face. Rowan, ducking his head, did the same. His goodbye to Kaol was quick, their embrace firm. Dorian lingered longer, graceful and steady, even as Rowan found himself struggling to speak past the tightness in his throat. And then Elin stood before Dorian and Kaol, and Rowan stepped back, falling into line beside Edian, Fenris, Lorcan, Elide, Ren, and Lysandra. Their fledgling court the court that would change this world. Rebuild it. Giving their queen space for this last, hardest goodbye. She felt as if she had been crying without end for minutes now. Yet this parting, this final farewell. Elin looked at Kaol and Dorian and sobbed. Opened her arms to them, and wept as they held each other. I love you both, she whispered. And no matter what may happen, no matter how far we may be, that will never change. We will see you again, Kaol said, but even his voice was thick with tears. Together, Dorian breathed, shaking. We'll rebuild this world together. She couldn't stand it, this ache in her chest. But she made herself pull away and smile at their tear-streaked faces, a hand on her heart. Thank you for all you have done for me. Dorian bowed his head. Those are words I'd never thought I'd hear from you. She barked a rasping laugh, and gave him a shove. You're a king now. Such insults are beneath you. He grinned, wiping at his face. Elin smiled at Kaol, at his wife waiting beyond him. I wish you every happiness, she said to him. To them both. Such light shone in Kaol's bronze eyes that she had never seen before. We will see each other again, he repeated. Then he and Dorian turned toward their horses, toward the bright day beyond the castle gates. Toward their kingdom to the south. Shattered now, but not forever. Not forever. Elin was quiet for a long time afterward, and Rowan stayed with her, following as she strode up to the castle battlements to watch Kaol, Dorian, and Yurin ride down the road that cut through the savaged plain of their Alice. Until even they had vanished over the horizon. Rowan kept his arm around her, breathing in her scent as she rested her head against his shoulder. Rowan ignored the faint ache that lingered there from the tattoos she'd helped him ink the night before. Gavriel's name, rendered in the old language. Exactly how the lion had once tattooed the names of his fallen warriors on himself. Fenris and Lorcan, a tentative peace between them, also now bore the tattoo had demanded one as soon as they'd caught wind of what Rowan planned to do. Edian, however, had asked Rowan for a different design. To add Gavriel's name to the Turason not already inked over his heart. Edian had been quiet while Rowan had worked quiet enough that Rowan had begun telling him the stories. Story after story about the lion. The adventures they'd shared, the lands they'd seen, the wars they'd waged. Edian hadn't spoken while Rowan had talked and worked, the scent of his grief conveying enough. It was a scent that would likely linger for many months to come. Elin let out a long sigh. Will you let me cry in bed for the rest of today like a pathetic worm, she asked at last, if I promise to get to work on rebuilding tomorrow. Rowan arched a brow, joy flowing through him, free and shining as a stream down a mountain. Would you like me to bring you cakes and chocolate so your wallowing can be complete? If you can find any. You destroyed the word keys and slow mave. I think I can manage to find you some sweets. As you once said to me, it was a group effort. It might also require one to acquire cakes and chocolate. Rowan laughed, and kissed the top of her head. And for a long moment, he just marveled that he could do it. 
could stand with her here, in this kingdom, this city, this castle, where they would make their home. He could see it now, the halls restored to their splendor, the plain and river sparkling beyond, the stag horns beckoning. He could hear the music she'd bring to the city, and the laughter of the children in the streets. In these halls. In their royal suite. What are you thinking about, she asked, peering up at his face. Rowan brushed a kiss to her mouth. That I get to be here. With you. There's lots of work to be done. Some might say as bad as dealing with Erewhon. Nothing will ever be that bad. She snorted. True. He tucked her in closer. I am thinking about how very grateful I am. That we made it. That I found you. And how, even with all that work to be done, I will not mind a moment of it because you are with me. She frowned, her eyes dampening. I'm going to have a terrible headache from all this crying, and you're not helping. Rowan laughed, and kissed her again. Very queenly. She hummed. I am, if anything, the consummate portrait of royal grace. He chuckled against her mouth. And humility. Let's not forget that. Oh yes, she said, winding her arms around his neck. His blood heated, sparking with a power greater than any force a god or word key could summon. But Rowan pulled away, just far enough to rest his brow against hers. Let's get you to your chambers, Majesty, so you can commence your royal wallowing. She shook with laughter. I might have something else in mind now. Rowan let out a growl, and nipped at her ear, her neck. Good. I do, too. And tomorrow. She asked breathlessly, and they both paused to look at each other. To smile. Will you work to rebuild this kingdom, this world, with me tomorrow? Tomorrow, and every day after that. For every day of the thousand blessed years they were granted together. And beyond. Elan kissed him again and took his hand, guiding him into the castle. Into their home. To whatever end, she breathed. Rowan followed her, as he had his entire life, long before they had ever met, before their souls had sparked into existence. To whatever end, fire heart. He glanced sidelong at her. Can I give you a suggestion for what we should rebuild first? Elan smiled, and eternity opened before them, shining and glorious and lovely. Tell me tomorrow. A better world. Brutal winter gave way to soft spring. Throughout the endless, snowy months, they had worked. On rebuilding Arinth, on all those trade agreements, on making ties with kingdoms no one had contacted in a hundred years. The lost Fay of Turason had returned, many of the wolf riders with them, and immediately launched into rebuilding. Right alongside the several dozen Fay from Doranel who had opted to stay, even when Endymion and Selene had returned to their lands. All across the continent, Elan could have sworn the ringing of hammers sounded, so many peoples and lands emerging once more. And in the south, no land worked harder to rebuild than Ilwi. Their losses had been steep, yet they had endured remained unbroken. The letter Elan had written to Neomia's parents had been the most joyous of her life. I hope to meet you soon, she'd written. And repair this world together. Yes, they had replied. Neomia would wish it so. Elan had kept their letter on her desk for months. Not a scar on her palm, but a promise of tomorrow. A vow to make the future as brilliant as Neomia had dreamed it could be. And as spring at last crept over the staghorns, the world became green and gold and blue, the stained stones of the castle cleaned and gleaming above it all. Elan didn't know why she woke with the dawn. What drove her to slip from under the arm that Rowan had draped over her while they slept? Her mate remained asleep, exhausted as she was exhausted as they all were, every single evening. Exhausted, both of them, and their court, but happy. Elide and Lorcan now Lord Lorcan Lorcan, to Elan's eternal amusement had gone back to Peranth only a week ago to begin the rebuilding there, now that the healers had finished their work on the last of the Valg possessed. 
they would return in three weeks, though. Along with all the other lords who had journeyed to their estates once winter had lightened its grasp. Everyone would converge on Arinth, then. For Edian and Lysandra's wedding. A prince of Wendland no longer, but a true lord of Teresan. Elin smiled at the thought as she slipped on her dressing robe, shuffling her feet into her shearling lined slippers. Even with spring fully upon them, the mornings were chill. Indeed, Fleetfoot lay beside the fire on her little cushioned bed, curled up tightly. And as equally exhausted as Rowan, apparently. The hound didn't bother to crack open an eye. Elin threw the blankets back over Rowan's naked body, smiling down at him when he didn't so much as stir. He much preferred the physical rebuilding working for hours on repairing buildings and the city walls to the courtly bullshit, as he called it. Meaning, anything that required him to put on nice clothing. Yet he'd promised to dance with her at Lysandra and Edian's wedding. Such unexpectedly fine dancing skills, her mate had. Only for special occasions, he'd warned after her coronation. Sticking out her tongue at him, Elin turned from their bed and strode for the windows that led onto the broad balcony overlooking the city and plain beyond. Her morning ritual to climb out of bed, ease through the curtains, and emerge onto the balcony to breathe in the morning air. To look at her kingdom, their kingdom, and see that it had made it. See the green of spring, and smell the pine and snow of the wind off the stag horns. Sometimes, Rowan joined her, holding her in silence when all that had happened weighed too heavily upon her. When the loss of her human form lingered like a phantom limb. Other times, on the days when she woke clear-eyed and smiling, he'd shift and sail on those mountain winds, soaring over the city, or Oakwald, or the stag horns. As he loved to do, as he did when his heart was troubled or full of joy. She knew it was the latter that sent him flying these days. She would never stop being grateful for that. For the light, the life in Rowan's eyes. The same light she knew shone in her own. Elin reached the heavy curtains, feeling for the handle to the balcony door. With a final smile to Rowan, she slipped into the morning sun and chill breeze. She went still, her hands slackening at her sides, as she beheld what the dawn had revealed. Rowan, she whispered. From the rustle of sheets, she knew he was instantly awake. Stalking toward her, even as he shoved on his pants. But Elin didn't turn as he rushed onto the balcony. And halted, too. In silence, they stared. Bells began pealing, people shouted. Not with fear. But in wonder. A hand rising to her mouth, Elin scanned the broad sweep of the world. The mountain wind brushed away her tears, carrying with it a song, ancient and lovely. From the very heart of Oakwald. The very heart of the earth. Rowan twined his fingers in hers and whispered, Awe in every word, for you, fire heart. All of it is for you. Elin wept then. Wept in joy that lit her heart, brighter than any magic could ever be. For across every mountain, spread beneath the green canopy of Oakwald, carpeting the entire plain of Theralis, the king's flame was blooming.